Welcome to the Andy Social Podcast. My name is Andy. Surprise, surprise. Who would have thought? I know you're absolutely blown away. Drop in the bombshell. Write a new story about it. All right, fucking hell. All right, let's get straight into it. Um, oh, actually, if this is the first time you're listening to this podcast, sorry. I, I'm sorry. Please bear with me. Um, welcome, and I hope that you enjoy this week's episode. Um, it is a really, really good one and a really enjoyable chat. Uh, if you do enjoy this episode, then uh, please go back and listen to some of the previous guests that I've had on the podcast. I've had lots of really, really cool people from all sorts of backgrounds and uh, some really, really amazing conversations that I've had. Very fortunate. And uh, if you are a super cool podcast listener, then hopefully you'll do what any amazing podcast listener would do and subscribe to the Antisocial Podcast on iTunes or whatever podcast catching platform that you utilize. If you're one of the faithful and the loyal that's been listening every week, to my absolutely amazing voice. Welcome back. I know you've missed me and hopefully this episode will meet all expectations and hopefully even exceed them. Speaking of which, let's just get into this episode. I'm so sorry, guys. All right. This week's guest is with a gentleman by the name of James Straker. Now, I can't remember exactly how I came across James. I think it was from a random Instagram follow a year or so ago and uh, I first saw one of James James's many side ventures uh, being Frankie's Arcade. And um, in a nutshell, what it is, is he's found these old retro um, arcade machines and fixed them up and he supplies them to local bars and pubs around the Brisbane City area. I'll let him explain it a bit better than, than what I just did. But um, it's a very, very cool thing that he does and some really awesome old school games that he has. Now, that's one thing. And then I started following him in further detail, and I was blown away with what this guy gets up to on a day-to-day basis. Now, once again, another podcast guest who's over-the-top humble (laughs) and doesn't think much of himself as far as um, more or less an average Joe that's not very good at much apart from talking. But um, this is a a super cool person, and uh, I'm so fortunate that I've got this crazy excuse being a podcast to be able to have great conversations with uh, with people and this is a really really cool chat i'll let james explain who he is what he does what he gets involved with what he's been involved with in the past um there's just so many things i will say before we kick right into it that um i will put links to everything that we speak about in the show notes over at andysocial.net including james's instagram page so make sure you follow him um, if you want to follow him right now it is J Straker Troublemaker, all one word. So that's J-S-T-R-A-K-E-R Troublemaker, all one word. And you can find him on Instagram. Heaps of uh, heaps of funny photos and really cool stuff on there. Um, but he's got a LinkedIn profile that I'll also uh, link in the show notes. And I'll just quickly read out some of the things that he's written down as far as fe- uh, featured skills and endorsements. So he's got won a drag racing championship on a 1978 Suzuki GS750. Played guitar live twice for no effects. Fell out of a plane on two separate occasions. Had a brain hemorrhage in 2002 and told docs it was 1991. I have my own action figure. I'm a white belt in jujitsu. I have been published. I've been a published model twice in international fashion magazine. <laughs> Daughter's legal middle name is Trouble. <laughs> so uh, this is... It, that's just scraping the surface and we touch on a few of these things but heaps of other stuff and i i say i don't even say this lightly i feel like we've been separated at birth there's so many cool things that and um his mindset and and his perspective on life and and just different things that he even some of his insecurities and his modesty and and things that he thinks he's not very good at I, i'm listening and going am i is this just replaying my own life? This is, this is incredible. So it was really, really, really cool to chat to him, but also a little bit reassuring that there's other people out there that uh, have a similar sort of outlook on life that uh, that I do as well. So anyway, sorry, I know I carry on way too much and I always try to make these intros shorter and shorter and shorter, but once again, I'm blowing this out. So let's kick right into it. Enjoy this episode with James Stoker. 
Well, hello there. Oh, good evening. Uh, it is a good evening. I'm sipping a beer. <laughs> what are you drinking? Uh, Burley Brewing uh, Big Head Lager. <clears throat> Lovely. I've had that. That's a good one. Nice it's, one. Um, I'm, I'm trying to be less fat. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the best of both worlds. You can still enjoy beer but not feel so guilty about it. Well, I'm getting fit, right? No carbs. <laughs> <laughs> That's my kind of logic. I like that. <laughs> yeah, um, I like I like the I like the podcast name Andy Social. It works on a couple of different levels. It does. I my wife, my now wife, um, used to call me Andy Social when I wouldn't stop talking. So it was sort of the the anti anti social by <laughs> by renaming it Andy. So I thought, oh, that kind of works. It's a it's kind of catchy as well, a bit witty. So I'll, I'll use that. I love it. <laughs> well, what the first question I had to ask you straight away was, did you get your truck unbogged? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I didn't first. Wait, we're recording already. Yeah, I just started, yeah. Boom. Uh, yes, I got the truck unbogged. Uh, so I went to my friend Bill's house to watch the new Twin Peaks episodes. She lives up on top of a mountain. She had her driveway, the, the, the real estate agent had her driveway graded freshly that day and they'd put no sort of base or anything or gravel or anything in it, just just literally topsoil. And I was driving a uh, three-ton flatbed truck and I turned around the bottom of the driveway and drove back up the driveway to get ready for the next morning. And I was just like, I felt it just sinking. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> so I tried for about two hours to get the truck out. I actually got the truck out and reversed it back down. I was like, oh, fuck this. I've got to get it out right out so the morning's not stressed. I forgot my friend, Dr. Uh, my friend Al, Dr. Danger, has a, an incredible, incredible saying, which is, the enemy of good is better. <laughs> and I forgot those sage-like words of advice, and I tried, I got bogged worse. <laughs> and uh, so then the next morning, I do the work with Bob, Cowboy Bob came and tried to, uh, I work on a gay porno, Dr. <laughs> Danger and Cowboy Bob. <laughs> bow, bow. Um uh, he, he, he came and tried to tow me out with his, his very masculine Jeep and that didn't work. And then these tow truck driver guys are angling and they came up and they didn't even use the tow truck. They were just like, <laughs> step aside with a snapper. And so the big fat tow truck driver and my hefty self jumped up and down on the back of the flatbed and the other dude just literally tore out. I really can't believe I forgot to video it, but this was literally like Tokyo Drift. He was just tearing <laughs> us, just like just fishtailing up the dirt driveway of this three ton flat bed. It was amazing. <laughs> and I I was privileged to only pay $165 for the joy. Oh, that's not bad. Just just more so your time than, than anything else. Oh, uh, well, that's, that's, it's kind of like the time zone. It, it's like, uh, in in keeping with you know, the brief free I did on your podcast, I kind of had this theory that the worst thing it's the worst thing about my time is uh, I'm spending time with a friend and I got a good meal, we watched TV show and had good conversation. That's that's not terrible, really. So that's it. No, you're. Uh, I don't have a, I don't have a lot of friends. I have uh, I know a lot of people and I have a small group of friends who somehow worked out how to put up with me and uh, I like really intense conversations and good conversations so I don't I don't really like going out that much I like just sitting around talking shit sounds good well it sounds like you're a glass half full kind of guy <laughs> gotta be otherwise I mean at the end of the day we're all dead so it's kind of like you know it's kind of a bummer uh, I definitely am I definitely would take that on board I'm definitely a glass half full kind of guy well, because I've fucked up so many things, you have to be. Otherwise, you'd sort of get pretty bummed out well, all the time. It's kind of a good thing if you if you're fucking up stuff along the way, because I mean, you don't. That's that what's that's what builds character and stories, and you wouldn't be where you are now for for your fuck ups along the way. What forty five overweight broke. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that glass half full. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's what made me overweight, the half full. Um, no, no, absolutely. Look, it's always one of those things. Like you know, I equate everything back to music because music, as cliche as it is, music has been my best friend my whole life. Mm. Um, if you take out all the top end frequencies and all the bass frequencies, music sounds terrible. And I'd like to test the theory. 
that you don't need to have shitty times to feel good times better. I'd like to test that theory, but uh, <laughs> but it definitely, it definitely, I guess, gives it. Speed. It's it's odd. I was talking to my friend uh, Caroline last night about this, and uh, we we're discussing roller coasters and that sort of stuff. And I can't really do fucking gnarly horror movies anymore. I can't really do gnarly roller coasters anymore. And we'll we'll, we'll pontificating the idea that maybe it's that reaching that point where you are aware of your own mortality. Where it's just kind of like, I don't want to feel like I'm dying on a roller coaster anymore. <laughs> You're getting old. That's it. I think it is. You become, there's this point where you become aware of what you have to lose. But do you, do you find that with that, you also find daily daily habits and things that are starting to creep up that you didn't even realize that you go, oh, geez, like, why am I doing that? I'm so old. <laughs> uh, I think the only thing I really feel daily, and this is like a classic old man thing to say, I, I feel I'm not an old man yet. I think I'm halfway. Like my granddad turned 101 or 102 this year. My dad's my dad's in his middle 70s and he's firing all cylinders. I've got reasonably good stock, I think. Yeah. Um, but I definitely have aches and pains and that's when you start when you start feeling like a real man like when you when you get out of bed you're like literally some mornings I have to roll myself out I, about <laughs> uh, about five years ago I got roster of fever and that came for you back with viral arthritis <sighs> and somewhere along the way I don't know exactly when or how I've got I've ruptured I think they're called facet joints in my spine uh, between T2 and T6 so it's like your thoracic region your spine so basically my central nervous system is on high alert all the time because of this. And like literally some points I'm like a prep till I get out of bed. Like I, I can't start to roll myself out, fall out of bed and kind of go, okay, time to get off. And that's when you sort of feel like, you know, oh, Jesus, I am actually getting old. Well, Ross River fever, that hangs around for, well, it never goes, does it? Once you get it, mm. it just it, it's just going to live, you have to live with it. Yeah, it's here for a good time, for a long time. Oh. Um, it, uh like you do, like in the last five years, I've had Ross River fever, viral arthritis, and cat scratch fever. I got fucking cat scratch fever. I didn't know that it wasn't just a Ted Nugent song. That's all I thought it I, was. <laughs> dude, it's an actual thing. Like, we, I got gifted these two, um, uh, two separate occasions, two, two, uh, like stray cats, kittens, and yeah. one of them scratched me on the thumb, and it, and it didn't heal for at about four or five weeks later. It still wasn't healing. I was like, uh, uh, you know, I do a lot of jujitsu, and I was selling motorbikes at the time, so I was kind of dicking around on them. And I'm like, now it just keeps getting scratched, and this huge lump came up in my armpit. Oh. And obviously, obviously, I assumed I was dying or something. And I went to the doctor. He's like, "Well, that's yeah, you know, we need to get you to check get, get that checked out." And I went to the, the place to get like a ultrasound or whatever it's called. And the lady looked at it and said, you "Got a cat?" I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> She's like, "Yeah, cat scratch fever." I was like. Fucking one of my lymph, the lymph node in my left armpit, one of them swelled up to three and a half centimeters by one and a half centimeters, Whoa. which is massive lump. Yeah, you'll feel that. Far, and I bet you it was painful as well. Yeah, yeah, it came up super quick. And um, so, yeah, I've, I've had a few a few of the fevers in the last <laughs> few years. You've, you've had a good run. Yeah, yeah, I've split my skull a bunch of times. I've had a brain hemorrhage. Uh, I've broken... My right arm in about five different places. Uh, never broken any legs, touch wood, so I'm just knocking on wood there. Yeah. I've, I've, I've given it a good whack. <laughs> well, that might get me to my next point. I was, you know, I do a bit of internet stalking, as you do. and That's what, I, that's what it's there for. Yeah, and, and I was trying to work out what exactly you do. As little so, as possible. Yeah, so I was just going to say, if somebody was going to say, or you were going to tell someone what you do, what would what would you tell someone? I make trouble. That's literally like my, yeah. my business name is, is where you make trouble. Um, I've been self-employed for so much my whole life, uh, except for about five years selling motorbikes, which wrapped up in 2015. So I can't remember. Um, I've been a band manager. I've played in bands. I ran a little record label. I've run a nightclub, owned a bar and restaurant for six years. I made a TV pilot for MTV with Matt from the Nation Blue and High Tension. Um, I've got real fucking bad ADD, and uh, I get <laughs> get distracted very quickly. Uh, I literally am the, the jerk of all trades, like a master of none, and I just love 
I've got literally no skill set. I, I can talk a lot and I can be on time. That's, that's literally the two things I'm good at doing. And uh, I'm a terrible guitar player. I can't hold a tune, but that, that for no reason should that ever stop you playing in a band. And I, um, I have two things that sort of as a younger dude pushed me to do a lot of stuff. One was my grandma died when I was pretty young and I was in hospital with her basically she was dying and she just talked to me a lot about how scared she was to die and there's a lot of stuff she hadn't done and she wasn't ready to go and that, like, I'm not even fucking around, that terrified me. Mm. That was my first real understanding. Like, my granddad died before her, but we never had that talk. We never had, I'd never had that experience with him. Yeah. Um, the other, on the flip side of that is Charles Schultz who drew peanuts, I have peanuts tattooed around my arm. Uh, he drew peanuts for about 50 years and anecdotally what happened was he announced his retirement. He drew his last comic strip on a Friday night. It was due to be published on Monday morning and he died on Sunday night. <laughs> so he died like the eve of his, his last comic being published. And to me, that's going to be complete, I'm making this up to make myself feel better. That's a dude who checked out and went, tick, 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 tick. I've done all the things I'm meant to do. I'm out of here. And uh, both those things kind of push me pretty hard to do. I mean, I, for, for like that, getting into a deep theological discussion, I think we're here for one, one, one uh, lap. Mm. And I don't want to fucking get to like, be like my grandma and just, you know, be lying, literally dying in bed going, fuck, I didn't eat that pizza. I should have. I didn't <laughs> go and see the pyramids. I should have. I didn't ask that girl out on a date. I should have. Uh, I'm in the process of, of, uh, of, uh, not writing, I tried to write it, and I'm a shit writer, uh, about creating a TV show, concepting TV show, all based on my disastrous dating, uh, which involves <laughs> asking asking a lot of girls out on dates in stupid ways and just getting shot down in flames. And yeah. There's one girl, one girl that I crush on, and uh, she works at JB Hi-Fi, and uh, there's something about JB Hi-Fi girls. Um, I'm married to one. You really? Yeah, yeah so I am. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing, though, right? JB yeah. Hi-Fi girls. And uh, uh, she had never seen Star Wars. Nothing physical had ever happened between us. Yeah. <laughs> it was going to after this. Um, she'd never seen Star Wars. I was like, now I should probably go and buy the DVDs off her. And, uh, well, fuck, if I'm going to buy the DVDs, I might as well dress up as Chewbacca while I'm doing it. <laughs> so I turned up at her work. One of my best friends, Jess, was in on now. She came with me because I needed to get documented evidence this actually happened because it was like the greatest thing. I was just going down in flames. <laughs> and um, so I turned up to work dressed as Chewbacca. She, I had no knowledge what was going to happen. She was at the front door with the security guy doing bag check. She assumed it was just like a Star Wars promo or something because I'm standing there in front of her. And then the flowers came out from behind my back and she realized who it was and what was happening. She got really embarrassed and ran off. And uh, so I had a manager page her back to the front counter. <laughs> and um, it, it turns out that's not funny. It is not funny <laughs> to dress up as Chewbacca. It is not funny to, to dress up as Chewbacca and go and buy Star Wars DVDs and take flowers to someone. <laughs> uh, and, and I learned a very important lesson. You can do the right thing for the wrong person. <laughs> oh, I love it. And I'll send you five. I'll send you photos of it. Oh, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, <laughs> did you make the noise? Yeah. No, no, no. I, did, I, didn't say, I didn't say anything. I was just like, oh, <laughs> this, this isn't going well. Oh, ne- ne- needless to say, we, uh, we never went on a date. <laughs> <laughs> but at but least, at okay, least okay. you gave it a red hot go. I got a good story. Yeah, that's, uh, it. that's worth I, it. I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of what I kind of called porch stories because mm. I think and again that, that I guess a fear of getting old or apprehension of getting old is that I think when you lose your facilities and your faculties not your facilities that's a building uh, your faculties <laughs> and you know you're sitting in an adult diaper all you've got is those memories and the, the, the crash and burns are probably better stories oh absolutely and the on that note, and you're saying before about you know the lessons that you learnt when you're young and wanting to not have any regrets when you you do get on your so so called deathbed, do, does that? I mean, obviously it motivates you, but does it motivate you in not just a positive way but a negative way? Like, do you do you stress yourself out because of it? 
I've definitely gone through bad periods of stress. I've, I've like a lot of people struggled with depression. Yeah. Uh, I've been on antidepressants twice, one for about a year, once for a year and a bit, maybe two years and once for about six months. Um, I'm definitely learning how to stress less. Uh, that's, Sorry, this is a like going back to the initial fucking question. There's my ADD. What do I actually do at the moment? <laughs> I work. I, I work for. I work for a friend's film prop company, uh, driving props around for him. That's he's like my friend Adam. here. I just think called Heads Up Film Services. Like just fucking rad dude, creative genius, half lunatic. Um, I literally get paid to drive props around for him. It's really really rad. Mm. And I have a business where I put vintage arcade machines out into venues. Uh, and have a little online collectible store that's starting. I basically, with the ADD, I just I, I need to do different things every day. I, I get uh, that's when I get depressed. Is when I'm when I'm slowed down. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely have been the bull in the china shop, just running too fast at things, <laughs> and and have fucked up a lot of fuck up. Literally every business I've had I've had I've burnt to the ground. <laughs> um, um, but had a good time doing it. Uh, that's it. And so, yeah, absolutely. Is there any human beings that don't stress? Like, you know, uh, I, I grew up, my dad had real bad PTSD from serving in Vietnam. Uh, and he had a super explosive temper when I was young, not physically, just, you know, you just, just mm. react very strongly to situations. And weirdly enough, it was, he didn't really learn to relax in his, I reckon, maybe 50s when he went back to work in North Vietnam. Mm. And he's a, he's a civil engineer and he was real, Freddie that, you know, any engineers he was working with who are of a similar age more than likely would have been NBA soldiers and they were, and that was super cool, and they like, no, no, you're Australian, you guys fought a good war, and while, while he's over there, he learned to do meditation, he does Reiki now, and, and yeah, he's right. definitely slowed down and, and become less stressed, and I think he discovered that in his 50s, I've probably discovered it in my late 30s, early 40s, I've got a daughter who turns nine this year, Frankie, and um, I, my job as a parent that I see it is for her. Hopefully, never have those stresses, but realistically, she will. But mm. if I can, if I can help her work out those stresses in her thirties, then it's her job to get her kids to do it in her twenties. And and I've, I've done my job as a parent then. So, ab- absolutely, the the fear of, of something chomping at your heels. Um, can, I don't think it. I don't think it stresses me. I think it, it's probably 80, no, 90, 10, 90% good motivation, 10% bad motivation. You probably need a little bit of that bad motivation anyway, because it just keeps, it keeps you on your toes. Because I think if it's all just positive all the time, then I think that's when, that's when you, it, it gets to that point where you get a little bit complacent as well. I'd I mean, like to test that theory, though. Still. Yeah, I'd okay, like yeah. Go on. <laughs> let's, let, let's, let's wait until I've actually had a period of time where everything's gone right. Um, <laughs> I've definitely, I, again, you know, on the cup half full thing, Yeah, I've definitely always had a more positive view of some shitty situations. Maybe not necessarily right at that time, but definitely post it. Hmm. Um I don't know why that is actually. I think the ADD really fucking helps because a lot of time I just forget what's happened. <laughs> um, yeah, like I mean, literally, like I've got no short term memory. I don't really remember being a kid at all. I have some memories of a couple of memories of primary school, a few memories of high school, and that's kind of it. Uh, I said I knocked my head around a fair bit. Uh, I took a lot of acid when I was in my teenage years and early twenties, <laughs> and a lot of. Uh, I self medicated my ADD with a lot of speed and a lot. Of, uh, <laughs> now, now I get the legal stuff. That's fine. Um, and uh, and, and, you, you, and probably, probably, you probably just live in the moment now more so than anything else. But I mean, that's probably the way to go. So you know, you well, there's that, there's that Buddhist idea of mindfulness, isn't it? You yeah, know, you're not meant to be worried about what happened yesterday. You're not meant to be scared of tomorrow. It's meant to be now. And that's something I've definitely always struggled with was was being. Uh, not complacent, being content in that moment. And probably I started riding motorbikes in 2008 uh, and motorbike riding was definitely the first time I ever felt what I would describe as a meditative state. Mm. Um, I I bought a friend's old 1978 Suzuki GS750, which in its day was like the most powerful street bike you could buy. And now I think uh, like a modern 250 probably leaving dust, but um, I'd never, ever ridden a motorbike before. And uh, 10 weeks after I bought it, 
I won the nostalgia drags at Willow Bank on it. Um, <laughs> and again, not too bravado or stupid. It's just like literally my friend was sponsoring it. They had a, a rider pull out and they needed a certain number to qualify for, you know, like a, a, a national drag racing association thing. I was winning and just literally just in my style, more ass than class, won it. Um, <laughs> and like the day, I, the day I picked the bike up, I had around a friend's business and he was, checking the safety of the bike for me and the bike was completely unroadworthy. I said, like, you know, as long as it's safe, I don't really give a shit. And I got to his workshop and I said, you know, do you have a, do you have a toilet? I need to pee. I'm, I'm real nervous. I've never ridden a motorbike before. He's like, yeah, yeah, mate, around the corner. And I came back and you see this look on his face and he's just like, did you just say you've never ridden a motorbike? I was like, nope. He's like, scooter? I was like, nope. And he's like, you know, dirt bike? He's like, nope. And so my first time ever riding a motorbike was like about 4.30 in peak hour traffic in Brisbane on a Friday afternoon. Um, <laughs> I stalled it probably like four or five times in the first kilometer and the electric start didn't work. I only had a kickstart to get off my bike, kickstart it, start again. And um, that's not like, and then the drag racing was the same. It's like I've never even been to a drag race before, let alone competed in one. And it's not like bravado or thinking I'm a tough guy, but part of what ADD has is a, is a lack of filters in your brain that, that the slow the information doesn't tend to slow down very much on its way through. So <laughs> it's just like that thing of, sure, why, why wouldn't I do that? Yeah, you don't have time to sort of overanalyze it and then think about your insecurities or go, oh, I'm, I'm not good enough or I'm not experienced enough to do it. It's just like the idea itself sounds sounds pretty good and uh, why yeah, not? That's it. yeah, worry about it later. <laughs> And, and my insecurities about my tiny penis don't matter on a motorbike. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, one of the things on your website, and you mentioned this just before, was your arcade machines. And I think that's how I, I have I have a really bad habit of telling people, I go, I don't know where I met you. And they're like, well, I'm, I remember meeting you. And that's like, oh, that must have been just me intoxicated and drunk. But, <laughs> but... <laughs> My my understanding of when I sort of came across you was I think it was through Frankie's Arcade and seeing some of the arcade machines and it must have been just a random follow on Instagram. I could be completely yeah, yeah. wrong. So, yeah. so, but basically, I was looking for a way as a self-employed person to essentially... Like, so, so for five years, I sold motorbikes. Mm. I worked at a team, team motor store and I sold Harleys for three years after that. And it was the first time in my life I'd ever had a salary. I'd never had holiday pay before, never had superannuation before. I was like, this holiday pay is fucking wicked stuff. You go away and they keep paying you. That's weird. Like, <laughs> how does this happen? <laughs> and so trying to be a responsible adult, and like, you know, have a nice house for my daughter and myself and, um, you know, being less of a shit cunt and just getting stuff done. Uh, I was like, okay, well, ha- how do I have some sort of uh, income that's just, just not passive per se, just, just trickles over. Mm. And again, AD, my ADD and my sense of ego, not ego is a bad thing, but you know, sense of self, like normally I would have gone, oh, I'll open an arcade bar or open a hot rod shop or, you know, whatever. I'll open, I own a bar or lots of stuff. And I was like, well, that's all those things caused me so much stress, you know? So I was like, okay, I don't really want the stress and I don't really want to be tied to a job. I want to be able to go and do other things. So I kind of, I don't honestly remember like, the light bulb going off or anything like that. It just happened that, I was like, arcade machines. And, um, you know, being born in the early 70s, growing up in the 80s, arcade games are a big part, computer games are a big part of my life. I'm not like a, a full-on gamer. I'm not like, you know, a Call of Duty guy or like that, but, you know, I love computer games. And so I just started looking into it and uh, I set up a self-managed superannuation fund. So I think six machines now are actually acquisitions of my self-managed super fund. Um, so... So they, they trickle income, quite good income, honestly, into my superannuation because, again, as a self-employed person, it's really hard to put superannuation away. Yeah. Um, and then the other machines, which my own well, my business, they, uh, again, same thing, just provide this small passive income. So at the moment, I probably make, I guess, probably my super makes two to 300 bucks a week yeah, cool. out of it. And uh, I think I'm making about, I don't know, like anywhere between four and six hundred, seven hundred dollars a week on a good week out of the, the ones my business owns, and so the idea there is that what I want to get to is a point where essentially my cost of living is paid for by the arcade machine income, and then I'm a little bit more free to go. Oh, hey, I want to go work on a movie set for two weeks, or go work. You know, there's a band coming out that I'd like to go on tour with and go and work with them for a couple of weeks, 
and not have the, or just, if I could just take uh, uh, two weeks off and go gold panning with my daughter, you know, just so they don't have that stress of, oh, I don't have any money, and then, you know, you come home broke and sad. Um, and it's it's working out pretty good. Like, uh, I've always been pretty lucky on the pop culture side of things to be a little ahead of the the, the curve on, on, and not through any fucking genius or anything like that, just because I've, I've always been immersed in pop culture. Like, I owned a collectible store when I was young, and um, I, I think I just got in in front of the sort of the, 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 the big tidal wave of what's going through at the moment, mm-hmm. which is quite lucky. And, you know, people like Netherworld up here are doing such a killer job of, of making such an incredible arcade bar. And all around the world, this is, you know, it's the 30 year revival thing, you know, like, basically, you know, if, I think Donkey Kong's 35 years old, something like this year, and uh, people such as myself and my age are getting that nostalgia for it, and now we go out and spend $12 on a beer and $2 on a computer. That's it. Perfect. I'm just mm. looking at um, I'm looking at the arcade uh, page on your website, and I'm just looking at these classic games, and I'm a, I'm a little bit younger than you, but these are all games that I grew up with, uh, probably actually except for Galaga. Galaga? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, it, it, that's that's the, the million dollar question. Is it Galaga or Galaga? <laughs> I'm always like, I speak I speak the Queen's English, you see, so it's Galaga. Galaga. Um, <laughs> and and I think this is the interesting thing. Gaming has come so far. So for for me and for a lot of people growing up, arcade games weren't something you had at home. Mm. Consoles consoles weren't like a super big thing yet. So the arcade games were literally on the weekend or after school. And you'd go down and be scared by the tough guy who had his twenty cent piece up there already in the cigarette in his mouth and probably a cooler BMX bike than you had. And, mm-hmm. um, and so it was a social thing. And, and interestingly, I think gaming has become so intense and so depersonalized. Like you're, t- you're playing Call of Duty and you're talking to 20 people, but they're in Lithuania and, yeah. and you know, America, they're not next to you. And I think it's, I, I sort of feel as though the, the rise of the arcade machines, again, again, there's a nostalgia part to it, but also that you can go out, talk shit with your buddies, or take you on a date and let it kick your ass in Mortal Kombat. Well, I think um, I think that's a big resurgence is the whole face to face interactions out in a social setting outside of the house. And I think there's it's 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 so it's like the Twilight Zone. It's such a unique and it's it's almost a novelty for a lot of young people now to be out in these these weird social settings out outside of the house and. You know, I mean, I, I can see one of your one of your machines is at Crowbar, and those guys have just absolutely taken the old concept of a of a a licensed venue that plays music and created this sort of multi leveled establishment, which is you know multi functional with you know just not just live music but all sorts of stuff that they have there. Yeah, look, and, and look uh, venue, venues like Crowbar are such a good example. You know, Chad and Tyler have such an amazing job with that venue, mm-hmm. and it's the same as kind of like. Filmed, it's because the people who grew up loving that music are now running the venues. Yeah. The people who grew up loving movies are now making movies. You know, they're, they're doing podcasts, things like this. So before I am, like, you know, when I was growing up, the dudes who ran, like, you know, I grew up in Brisbane. I was going out in the valley. I was managing bands. I was like 14 or 15 years old. There's this place called The Outpost, which was like the yeah. seedy super punk rock bar and you know, you go in there underage, no problems. I was run by Italian mafia and stuff like that. So <laughs> they weren't music fans. They were simply there to make money off liquor and whatever else. And so now you've got this, this, this point in time where those kids have grown up and run the venues, make the movies. So all of a sudden it becomes uh, not so much just like, a, oh, we've got a live venue who will put some punk rock on, I think it's called. You know, it's, it's actually people <laughs> who live and breathe it, you know. So you do have, I think, a little bit more dedication. Like, you know, Netherworld's a great example as well. You know, those people are brewing their own soft drinks, brewing their own beers, you know, putting on arcade competitions. They're not just like, oh, shit, we heard pinball's cool. We better put some in there, you know. Mm. Like, these these people are living and breathing it. It's awesome. It's... um. I think it's it's definitely something that's coming back and there's there's so many things now where people are trying to provide an actual experience instead of just a, a hole in the wall place that you you go and have a beer or you go and watch, you know, a band play and that's it and it's just the bare basics. Now it's like a whole experience when you come out and you know, we I mean, I used to live in I grew up in Brisbane, but I've lived in Sydney for 10 years and I came in to, to Sydney with probably on the tail end of a relatively healthy scene 
at least at that point in time, and then just watched it all yeah, sort of road like, away. Like your Annandale and the Sando yeah, land down. Absolutely. Yeah. And and then just watch it erode away over the over the coming years with all the different, you know, government changes and laws and whatnot. But a big problem that a lot of people didn't see and didn't take advantage of is that they were a lot of these places were all about the basics. It was it was a bar on the side side of the room and then there was a stage. And that's all you needed at the time because people were happy enough. But then it got competitive. And it was a sando. And it was a sando. You had to build the stage first before you played. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, but um, but a lot of the things now and the problems that that as in Sydney, for example, is that people aren't trying to create an experience. It's just they're they're desperate to find a, a place that actually puts on music, and then they'll just put on a show, and then that's it. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and it's, I, it's I so think, competitive I, now. I think that's also thing. There's so from a commercial point of view. There's so many places and ways for people to spend their money now, you That's know, right. like, and I think for the most part, people like Crowbar and people like Netherworld are absolutely doing it for pure reasons. Like it's from a love and a passion first and a financial point of view second, but also for, for most businesses, I mean, like I was just, you know, I just read something yesterday that Topshop Australia has gone into receivership. Like these huge businesses yeah, that, that come from massive backgrounds and really successful are, are going under because you can online shop now, you know? So mm. I think aside from the, the passion of places like Crowbar and Netherworld, there's also a necessity with, with business models now. Where like you can't just sit in your fucking ass and expect people to turn up anymore. Oh, you got to keep changing. It's just not, it's just, you, you've, well, you, you've got to give bang for buck, you know? You can't just, you know, you can't just put a flyer up or put a Facebook post up and go, oh, cool, a couple hundred people come along. Mm, that's it, that's it. It's, um, it's a it's a never ending battle with bands, and I'm sure you 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 vouch for this with just you being a part of sort of a lot of sort of the local sort of music and whatnot. I mean, bands now, especially these days, it's like you know we'll create a Facebook event and, and all my friends will see it, and that that should be enough. If they know about it, they'll rock up, and then people go, oh yeah, I'm interested, and you get like 200 people saying they're interested, and then 20 people actually rock up on the on the night. But yeah, because there's, there's the big. It's, it's so easy just to hit like or going oh, attending yeah, and that's and it. that's it you know and, and again there's so much distraction you know you've got you know someone who previously might have on a friday night got you know like me growing up on a friday night you know you didn't have tinder to distract you oh fuck me i see my friend's band play all of a sudden bam swipe left or swipe right or i've never been on tinder or it's like swipe whichever way is the good way and <laughs> you know all of a sudden there's some girl or guy going hey do you want to meet up for a drink and you're like, oh, sorry, friends, band, I'm going to get late. You know, it's changed. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. There, there is so much distraction like that, you know. Um, Even at home, yeah, like with things like Netflix and just the internet in general. I mean, for a lot of people, you got everything at your fingertips. You can order stuff in. And I mean, there's, oh, I'm not sure if it's up in Brisbane, but there's a few places around that do, you know, beer delivery, alcohol delivery and, and whatnot. So it's just really for, for some people, you you don't really need to leave the house at all. And I mean, it's probably a pretty sad existence, but a lot of people lo it, love the convenience and the novelty of it. Yeah, for sure. I, I was listening to the Joe Rogan podcast yesterday with this dude, Jocko. I can't remember his I term. just, I I just finished, and finished listening to that today. Oh, uh, so yeah, good. Yeah. And I was talking about the exact thing, but it, what's interesting as well is as that becomes more of a thing, a more homogenized sort of easy hit, click, get it sent to you sort of thing, does that also push some people into doing more visceral experiences and I guess like I've always been a fan of visceral experience of that mm -hmm. like I, I want to I want to sweat I want to bleed I want to cry I want to laugh whatever I, I just want I don't want lightweight experiences I want if something's going to be heavy be the heaviest fucking thing you can be you know yeah. um, and it's interesting that you know, again, watching people, you know, and you know, as much of the cliche shit like CrossFit can be or paleo diets, that kind of stuff, there's a natural reaction. The pendulum has to swing back the other way. So as, you know, there's more of an inclination for people to stay in and not go out, okay, there's going to be a percentage of the, 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 the society that goes, well, fuck it, I'm going out more now. Or, you know, I'm going to go and, and do CrossFit instead of sitting on the couch. Like, you know, it's not enough just to go, I'm going to go jogging anymore or go running. It's like the people people need that that dopamine hit. I think the dopamine hit is getting harder and harder for people to find. Yeah. 
people are always going to be searching for more and you know you can make life as easy as possible for people and people still will not be satisfied people are always looking for something more than what they have at the moment and it's just human instinct i mean you can have i'm a big thing on the whole mindfulness thing i'm always ranting and carrying on about it and you can be content and be accepting in your situation and your place but i think instinctively as as humans we're we're always got a relative like a well, varying degrees but we've got some varying degree of dissatisfaction where we're always searching for something else some well, sort that's of again that, that that interesting that interesting thing that i've heard a couple of times with different guests on joe rogan's podcast about that it could well be part of evolution is that you know if you sat in the cave and or the whole time you know and the floodwaters come and flood your cave out, you're fucked. So you have to go and find that different cave, or you know, you have to go and find another source of food. And that's what's really interesting. And again, you're talking about why people are doing searching for more intense dopamine hits is because it's it's we, we, we've lost part of evolution. We've become sort of stagnant a little bit. Mm. We, we live we live very easy life for the most part, you know, especially in a country like Australia, for the most part, people live a very easy life. There's not a lot of struggle. And that's, like, I, I started doing jiu-jitsu about five years ago and uh, never taken something like that before. It was just amazing. And I've never been in a fight in my entire fucking life. I've never struck a human, never done anything, you know. And I really fell in love with it and I, I w- w- wondered why a lot. I think it is that your body is meant to do stuff that's difficult. Mm. It's part of evolution. Yeah, Yeah, it's part. It's part of you know of uh, not dying in the pack. I guess. Absolutely, absolutely. I think I think you just uh, just answered uh, the question that we had right at the beginning, where we're saying you know you have to go through some shit to in order to (laughs) in order to appreciate. Yeah, and 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 that's it. And and the the physical, like you know, and, and even just like. Genetically, our bodies haven't evolved to what technology has made us do. Mm. I read this book years ago called The 24 Hour Society, and it was written by the dude who discovered circadian rhythms. Yeah. Well, I read about, I read about half of it, and then I put it down and then picked it up again. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and basically, he was attributing a lot of industrial accidents to shift work. You know, like up until the Industrial Revolution, essentially, you'd wake up when the sun came up go and toil in the field or whatever it was and then go to bed when the sun went down and, you know, that's the way our bodies worked. And, and I don't remember the last time I slept more than six hours or seven hours, you know? Like, you know, we have electricity which lights up our houses more. We have phones which brighten in front of our faces. And it's funny, uh, for my friend Phil's house where I went to watch Twin Peaks the other night, I slept on a, on a, a little mattress on her lounge room floor and she had a fire, like, a, you know, like a, an enclosed fireplace and she said, oh, the sun's going to wake you up in the morning. Come straight in through that those windows there. And I woke up around and maybe like 6.30, and I think the sun must have come up about 45 minutes beforehand. And I don't remember having a better sleep than that in my adult life. I felt <laughs> so good. I've been thinking about this a lot. Like, why did I have such a good sleep? And literally, I was in a little dark cave with a fire burning. The fire went out during the course of the night. The sun was on my face for probably 45 minutes. Vitamin D has gone through my body. I didn't get woken up by an alarm. Yeah, I didn't get woken one. up by someone next to me. I didn't get woken up by a dog or a truck or any of that. I just, my, I think my body for the first time in a really, really long while woke up genetically as it was meant to wake up. Naturally woke and, up, yeah. And I had, a, I had a reasonably stressful time with the, getting the truck out and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> I should have been a bit irked, but I just, I just can't remember having that good a sleep in a really, really long while. You know, it was it was, it was a, a really quite sort of oh shit! I got to look at this a little bit more. <laughs> a bit of a mind reset in a way. Well, yeah, I think it was just like like I said. You know, obviously, you know, you, and if you listen to Joe Rogan, you would have heard Do, uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick on there. Yeah, yeah. The, the man, she blows my mind, and just like vitamin D, like fucking, it's involved in like twelve hundred functions in your body or something crazy like that. Yeah. You know, and like I had a really interesting experience. Like, um. When I started getting the the, uh, the spine issues, uh, at first uh, I thought I might have had like MS or motor neuron disease. Like mm-hmm. I was training doing jujitsu, and all the fucking toes of my right foot would just go white, like just oh. like real. And and Simon, one of my coaches, my friend Simon, um, he was like, "Dude, you know, you know, you should probably go to a doctor." And I've been trying to be less of a dude and go to a doctor more often. <laughs> and um, 
So he was like, yeah, that's no good. So he, I got a really good GP, the young dude. He, he said, you know, I don't, he did a few tests, like, you know, with a feather, checking my reactions on my feet and all that sort of stuff. He look, your, your, your circulation's fine. He said, that's good. But he said, what concerns me is that it could be MS or motor neurons or something like that. I was like, that's like, oh. Mm. Um, so when I, when I had all my blood done, touch wood, thankfully it wasn't. And, uh, but now that we have my blood done, I get them done about every three to six months. And it's so fascinating looking at the different levels of vitamins and nutrients and everything in your body. So what was interesting was my vitamin D was really low. This is when I was selling motorbikes. I was out in the sun on the sales yard quite a lot during the day and out riding bikes. I think it was fucking bizarre my vitamin D low. But what it was was that uh, the Harley store was on Breakfast Creek uh, in here in, down the bottom of the valley and there was a lot of sand flies. So every day I would put a fuck ton of sunburn cream on uh-huh. to stop the sand flies from biting me. Yeah, yeah. And over, over a three-year period, it actually had an effect on my vitamin D levels. Hmm. And about six to, nine, six to nine months after I stopped working there and wasn't putting sunburn cream on anymore, my vitamin D raised back up again. Wow. It was crazy. And then even weirder ones, like I'm sitting there and the doctor's like, uh, you know, it says your testosterone's a little low. And I, at the time, I was in full bush range of mode with my beard. <laughs> and like, this is weird because your beard's telling me a very different story. <laughs> and uh, lower testosterone is linked to depression. Right. Uh, and also, like, you know, I've got about probably five to eight kilos of excess fat on me I should, probably shouldn't have. And this is what blew me away as well, is that I'm, in men, excess body fat converts testosterone to estrogen. Oh, right. And, and again, you know, we just don't, like, we know this no. stuff. We have the science, we're just not taught it. Mm. And because we're not getting our blood done, we're not aware of these things. It's become really fascinating to me now. Like I said, every three to six months, getting my blood work done. And they give you this, uh, you know, like a printout of your new test, and it shows all the, all the, like, I think I've been getting done for almost three years now. Yeah. Two and a half years, something like that. 2015, I think I started getting done. That's actually really fascinating. Hey, like, just looking and going, oh, okay, well, you know, do I go on testosterone replacement therapy? No, it's not that low. And, uh, you know, I've used this thing called tribulus, which is a testosterone uh, regulator. Mm. A lot of people think it's a, a booster, but it's not. It's if, if your testosterone is low or raise it, if it's high, it'll drop it. Right. And that's raised up to a better level, like it's within normal range now. Uh, but then you're like, okay, you know, go lift some heavy weights, eat some more meat. And uh, my girlfriend, I was with for seven years, um, she was a veg, or he's a vegetarian, not together anymore. Yeah, you know, and I, I, so I, I do a lot of cooking. So I cook a lot of vegetarian foods, so and my iron intake was dropping. And mm. yeah, it's fascinating all this stuff. Did you find that sort of looking back now, from when you started doing the first the first uh, tests, do mm. you f- physically feel that there's been a dramatic change over that time, or it's just no, sort of, feel, it's a gradual I, sort of change over? I don't feel any better, worse, or indifferent at all. Like yeah. I, I, like I, my body's kind of been through the ringer a fair bit in the last few years. I think that people mm-hmm. have way harder times than I have, but yeah, yeah. you know, just like I said, the roster of fever and stuff like that. So my theory and all this stuff is especially as I head towards my twilight years, um, <laughs> is that I work on the theory of feeling less worse. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, I don't want to be the 70-year-old dude who's literally shitting in an adult diaper and can't get out of bed. So that's a big part of me doing jujitsu is like, okay, I'm going to keep flexible. I'm going to improve my – and this one, this crazy shit find out as well, that your muscle strength has a direct effect upon your bone density. Mm. And this is why old people get brittle. Yeah. Because when your muscle strength drops, your body goes, I don't need as powerful a bone to hold that muscle Absolutely. there anymore. It. And it's like, why aren't we teaching people this shit? It's crazy. Like, you know, like they need to do better advertising, not just saying like, you know, go get fit because you should. It's like, do you want to be an old cunt who can't move? Go and do some fucking exercise and get your bones ready, you know, like, well, and that, so... Um, that's it. You need to spell it out to people because people just don't get it. And, and it's a lot of these old cliches of, you know, eating healthy and, uh, you know, body and... Uh, body and mind, and you know, all these, all these, all these things that have been drilled into us over the years. They're real. They are, they're, and they're and they're sayings for a reason. And I find it now, and I'm, I'm about to hit thirty, the old old age of 30, 30, 33. I had to think about that then. Um, but I found in the last couple of years where I constantly pull these cliches out of my ass that I probably have never said in my life, and then I go, oh my god, like. I'm a cliche. I'm a walking cliche, and then I realise, oh well, it's 
it's a cliche for a reason. There's actually some, there's some logic behind it. There's some wisdom. There's some magic behind these. <laughs> these well, I, absolutely. And, and so, like, I, I'm, I'm, a, like, I'm a hundred percent cynical and a hundred percent believer about stuff. Like, I want naturopathy to work, but I'm still cynical about it. Mm. But you know, like, there's, you know, like, and it's hard because, because obviously, with the internet now, we find about stuff like, you know, the the butter coffee was a thing, the MCT mm. oil. Crossfits of things. We get an inundation, and there's a, a natural reaction for a lot of people to fight against what's popular. I'm not one of those people. I don't give a fuck if shit's popular or not. I just want to do what makes me feel good. Yeah. And, um, but so, you know, a lot of people go, oh, natural is bullshit. I'm like, well, hold on a second. When you're young and you got a cold, what do your mum do? Oh, she made me, uh, you know, honey and lemon tea. What the fuck's that? That's naturopathy, dude. That's a natural medicine. Mm. And it's interesting um, that, that with naturopathy, that there's a push to stop calling it alternative medicine and to call it companion medicine. Yeah, that's it. You know? So, yeah, if you get your fucking arm cut off in an industrial accident, putting a poultice on it isn't going to help. Go and get some fucking <laughs> antibiotics to stop the infection coming in. But then, you know, have some probiotics to balance out what the antibiotics do. Absolutely. Um, but even, even something like that, I've been getting into making bone broth soup and that kind of stuff. Yeah, and, nice. and, you know, it's the same thing. If you say to someone, oh, you know, I've heard bone broth is really good for you. Like, oh, it's a fad. It's like, well, wait, wait, same thing. What did your grandma make you when you were sick when you were a kid? Chicken soup. You know, that was just, you know, that was what your grandma made you because it was healthy for you. Mm, mm, that's it. There's some things that are just, they've been around forever and it's it's for a reason. I mean, I'm I'm a... I'm, I'm very similar to you in the sense that I'll question, not so much question everything like this big conspiracy theorist or you know, everyone's <laughs> you're everyone's not, you're not, you're or anything not, like that. But you're not you're not Eddie Bravo. <laughs> no, oh god. <laughs> oh my god, he's so good. I love him. Oh man, he's he's intense. <laughs> I love him. But uh, it's I'm always like I'm very very critical of things and you know tradition and stuff like that. And I go, well, why are we doing? why are we doing this thing, whatever this action is? And the response is always, well, just because, because we've always done it that way. I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't make sense. So why do we keep doing the same thing over and over again? And, and, and that logic does work in a lot of cases, but in other cases, there are things that are in place and we just keep doing them over and over again, year after year, because there's, there's some rationale behind it. There's some, there's some benefit there. And I think we, we sort of forget about it. We just, we don't hate, we again, just take it for granted. Because there's so much distraction. Also, you know, obviously, again, without falling down the fucking rabbit hole of conspiracy theories, <laughs> you know, you have companies like McDonald's where it's not in their best interest to push healthy eating until someone starts suing them and they have to do it. Yeah. You know, that, that's the reality of commerce is that, you know, corn fructose syrup is cheaper to produce than sugar and there's an abundance of it. So chuck that in everything, you know, where, you know, it's just not good for you. But, you know, we went through advertising times where cigarettes were healthy. My, my, my granddad was, you know, still one of those people in the Navy got a ration of cigarettes. <laughs> Imagine, <laughs> like, <laughs> coming, setting up the armed forces. Here's your pack of cigarettes for the day, sir. It's like, it's just hilarious. Yeah, oh, man. It, and, I mean, it, it wasn't that long ago. That's the thing. Like, just, it's only one, genera- one, one or two generations prior to us. Yeah, and I mean, even in the, I mean, if you think about it, and I mean, you listening to Rogan, you'll you'll know this firsthand. You know, hearing about all the sort of extreme left sort of stuff in the United States with all the different uh, different rights that people are, are fighting for, and it's even in just probably in the last five years, the things that were five years ago that were accepted are are highly offensive to some people in in some parts of society now. And it's just, we're changing so quickly and it's very hard to sort of work out, well, where do I fit into this whole thing or should I be fitting into something? And, you know, do I have to? It's that that pendulum swing, isn't it? I think the pendulum has always swung backwards and forwards. Like, you know, me growing up again in the 70s, 80s, Mm. your typical Aussie was your kind of, your Chesty Bonds guy, you know, yeah. the, the, the guy from the, the Bonds advertising. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then, man, like, you, you pull up to a BP petrol station now and there's an ad for BP with a cricket player who's got a full sleeve of tattoos. <laughs> you know, it's like, can you imagine when you and I were kids, any advertisement... No way. ...in a positive sense, having someone with tattoos. But then you get to the point now where people are so heavily tattooed, so quickly and so young which I'm all for, fucking get as many tattoos as you want, I don't give a shit, I'm not your dad. Mm. Um, it's just that thing of like, there will be that reaction back to, in another 10 years or so, 
it'll be the clean cut Chesty Bonds guy again will be the, the, the sort of atypical Australian person or you know, atypical male male model sort of person. And so I think what's happening is the pendulums the pendulums always swung backwards and forwards. We just have access to viewing the pendulum so much quicker now. That's it, and the and the people with the tattoos will end up back on the old crime, crime stoppers uh, posters around around town <laughs> because that's, Man, that's one of the reasons the I, I, saw one, it. one of the reasons I love going to Japan is because you still feel like a badass over there. <laughs> oh well, that, well, there you go. So good segue because I was going to pick your brain about Japan. How many how many times have you been to Japan? Ah, uh, twelve or thirteen. I can't honestly remember a lot. Nice. Yeah, that's I, cool. I love it. It's it's it's, it's my favourite place on the planet. Like I've I, I got kidnapped by Japan for a long while. Um, <laughs> I think for maybe yeah for a really long while just because it's so close, it's so cheap, it's so easy, and everything over there is weird. And uh, for people that haven't been to Japan, I always describe it as the safest place in the world to be outside of your comfort zone. Like the shit you're gonna do there is crazy. You'll do it nowhere else in the world, and no one's gonna fuck with you. Like, people fuck with you, the tourists. Oh, and um, it's it's just rad, you know. You can, the, the, my my, what I love about Japan, like, and every country has its faults, and Japan is, is not without them. But from what I can understand, is the basic social law of Japan of do whatever you want to do or have to do as long as it doesn't impinge on someone else's day. So, like, you know, if you want to get up at seven o'clock in the morning, dress up like a tiger, and go and drink beer in a park, that's cool. Just don't get in anyone else's road. It's it's that sort of common sense, you know, that uh, it's not very common in, in other parts of the world or the majority of the world, really. It's such a it's such a closed off part of the world, but in a positive way, as opposed to like, you know, the other extremes, like, you know, parts of the Middle East or, or North Korea or whatnot, where it, there's a, a big segregation of, of culture and, and suppression it's, of it's people. A really, it, it's a really oppression. interesting country to look at because there, there's countries that are more densely popular, like, you know, you know, somewhere like India, which I haven't been to, I'd love to, it's just crazy hectic. Mm. There's pop, this very dense population in Japan, but it seems that there's a natural law of, I don't mean like maintaining the status quo, but respecting each other because otherwise society will just fall apart. And it, you know, it might be because it sort of comes from that feudal system where respect was such a more highly sought after and you know, almost like commodity, if you know what I mean. Like it's such a big thing in that in that country to show respect to people. Mm. Um it's really, it's just, it, it's an anomaly, Japan. It really is. It's, it's like, you know, like I went there um, just a few months ago uh, to go on tour with Nolfex again, and which I'm really lucky to do. And uh, we went and did the real world Mario Karts over there, where you're, like, you're driving a fucking go kart at 60 kilometers an hour through the streets of Tokyo, like through Rapongi up towards Tokyo Tower. <clears throat> dressed up, I was dressed up as Princess Peach, you know, like, <laughs> and it was, it was, it was $45. Yeah, like, how that? That's amazing. Like, <laughs> you can't go go-karting anywhere in the world or anything for $45 for an hour. <clears throat> and this was two guys, a guy behind you, guy in front of you, and, and, you know, we go up to Tokyo Tower and they take a photo and then by the time we get <clears throat> back to the, uh, back to the, the, the depot where you got the cards from, they print out the photo and we're like, oh, you know, how much for these? And they're like, no, 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 you've already paid. This is your free copy. It's like, what? So and, good. you know, I've done a bunch of strange things with those dudes in strange countries, and it was still one of the most surreal experiences I've ever had because I am a huge Mario Kart fan. The people thought really hard about it, and, you know, they <clears throat> had the routes mapped out really well. So you went through tunnels, across train tracks, through draw bridges, like, I'm just, it was, it was, and because you're in Japan, like, all the ads in Japanese, like, trucks are stopping to give way to us uh, because. Yeah. Best. They're polite. You know, any other country in the world, they just run you off the road. <laughs> it's so cool. I mean, I've, I haven't been as many times as you. I've been about uh, six or seven over the years. Mm. But um, same, exact same view as, as you. And it's, it is my favorite place in the world. And it's just one of those, from a cultural point of view, it's, it's fascinating. It's different, but the, the one of the coolest things that I, I always take away from it is the the cooperation, almost, or the harmony is probably a better word between old and new. And you've yeah, got the, yeah, the older absolutely. generation that's just well, at least on on face value anyway, appears to be very accepting of the younger generation, and vice versa. There's that there's that respect. I and, think that's a I think that's a facade. Yeah, I don't think yeah. it's I don't think it's real. I think. I don't mean that as a bad thing, like yeah, if there's a, an, a malice or, or, or some bad intent, but I think their society is so polite. Like, it's mm. really 
one of the most racist countries I've ever been to. Like, they don't <laughs> like bars foreigners. He, a lot of bars you can't get into. Yeah, because yeah. English, you speak Japanese. But they're kind of like, here's the deal. We like Japan, but they're not going to critique you for not being Japanese. They're not going to look down at you for not being Japanese. Like, I don't know if you've ever been there. I don't see them as much anymore. But these dudes who just dress in black and stand on top of vans, big speakers, just basically... Oh, yeah. Not not really yelling anti foreign stuff, but very pro Japanese stuff. Yeah, but the the politest racists in the world, <laughs> you know, like oh, actually, it's probably not racist; it's probably nationalist. I guess it's just yeah, they're very pro their nation, and it, it's such an interesting country. Like you think, like Fukushima and the earthquakes and the tsunami and everything, they would have devastated any other country's economy. Mm. Like just devastated it. Um, and D- Disney and Universal Studios is one where you know they. Up till 2011, it was kind of harder to get there with tattoos. Like, they'll make you put on a long sleeve shirt or yeah. stuff like that. But, but post Fukushima, there's no stress. You just walk through and, and there's no problems at all. But I know what you mean. But, like, the, the old people, they're definitely accepting. But I think it's that forced politeness. Yeah, I guess so. It's sort of like. Um, Actually, for, forced, forced is the wrong word. The expected politeness. Expected politeness, yeah. So it's almost like when you. When, when you give you, you punish you punish a guy in the street because you're trying to ask for directions somewhere and you can see him sort of struggling because he can't speak English very well but he's smiling and he's doing his best to help you and he's and he, he might even make up like an answer without even knowing what the answer is because he just wants to save face and be polite I've and had people, helpful. I've had people walk me 15 minutes to get me where I'm going where I've been yeah, lost yeah yeah I've had that as well where, where else does that happen yeah yeah it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. It's um, it's such a, it's just such a unique place. Oh, and going back to what you're saying about, I guess that national, national pride or sort of that nationalistic sort of viewpoint, uh, probably you know, probably a large part of the population, good and bad. Um, I've I've got a few sort of friends that are expats that have lived over there for years, end up marrying uh, Japanese people over there, and. And I remember sp- having conversations with a few of them and, you know, lived there for 20 odd years. And, and I remember one conversation with a guy and I said, do you ever feel like you're, you just, you're Japanese or you're part of, you're part of like, a local chance. area? And he said, no, nah. he goes, you'll never, nah. you'll never be a hundred percent accepted. You'll always be the foreigner. Yeah, yep. that's it. Absolutely. Gaijin. He goes, you can have, you know, you can speak fluent Japanese, you can immerse yourself in the culture, follow all traditions and customs, but you'll always be viewed that way. And he said, I get it and I accept it. And he said, at times it, it, it can be pretty, pretty hard to, to, to take in, but it, it is what it is. And I think that's, it, it's good and bad in some ways. And I think probably the positives is that they've been able to maintain the country in the way that they have. And, yes. and, you know, have this sort of closed off otherworldly place where they've just been able to maintain so much and not be highly influenced by, by other parts of the world. But um, I remember the first time I went to Japan, it must have been 2005, and um, I saw probably two Caucasian people in 10 days. And I went Tokyo, Nagoya, and Osaka, and then couple of years came went back and then i saw a few more and then a few more and then a few more and it's been a couple of years since i've been there but the last time i went just especially aussies because of those cheap jet star flights everyone was just taking advantage of them but it just so many tourists are there now and and that's good i'm sure it's good for their economy but you sort of it's that dreaded thing where you're traveling somewhere else in the world and then you hear that ocker accent oh, dude, around I, the corner and you run the other way it's like oh <laughs> get me away quick i can't it's funny, I, I, I could never go somewhere like bali or something like that because yeah. i don't want to be another fucking nouveau riche bogan trying to live like a king yeah. you know it's just it's just i i don't i, I just sounds really terrible i don't travel to meet other australians i travel to be in Australia, <laughs> you know? and I love coming home. That's why I live here. But I don't go to Japan to to be Australian or to do Australian things. Like I've never understood the idea of moving to England or you know, backpacking and just go to fucking Shepherd's Bush and hang out with Australians. You know, like I can do that for free here. Yeah. Um, but you know, different horses for different courses. I also like the, just the, the the extremities of Japan that you can do. Where if you like the the time was just just gone like. Mike took me to Osaka Jail, one of those dominatrix clubs, and 
I'm very much a tourist. I was, I was, there was nothing. I, it was so funny, like this dominatrix Vivian who was there was just like, you're not playing tonight, are you, sir? I was like, no, ma'am. And she's like, ah, oh, you didn't have that, you, you didn't have that vibe. I was like, because <laughs> I'm just there. <laughs> and I got like a prude. Um, and we, we literally had beers and whiskeys and then watched this Japanese businessman be dressed up in a pink outfit, uh, have his cock and balls just destroyed by a riding crop. <laughs> uh, by this, this fierce dominatrix uh, she beat his ball so hard till he came and then he cried <laughs> I was like oh my god <laughs> like, like this is like where, where this, is, this is amazing yeah. <laughs> would I do that would, would I do that would I do that in Australia no I wouldn't I don't want to go and see that in Australia but in Japan watching this very well to do Japanese businessman be dressed up is just nuts <laughs> there's something for everyone that really is <laughs> far out that's it that's, uh, that's the deal like, if you want to be a Japanese businessman and get dressed up and have your balls beaten in submission do it there's a place for you <laughs> and it's you and, and, and someone's there to, to welcome you in and, and make you feel like uh, you're not you're not a freak or <laughs> yeah. oh I'm not sure welcome is a term I would use in this occasion <laughs> <laughs> it was gnarly hey like uh, it was really it was like, like like I think literally for me anyway I'm not sure about other dudes there but my testicles were just rising back up inside my body cavity just like protect <laughs> us protect us well just at the thought of you saying that then I'm already I'm looking down cross-legged as it is now <laughs> yeah dude that's it it was crazy she just oh my god just beat him so hard with his riding crop it was nuts like literally nuts <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, and then the next day I'm dressed up as a woman driving a go-kart around <laughs> <laughs> Surreal. Um, you mentioned before about um, that last trip being over there with no effects. You've done, you've toured with them a couple of times. Yeah, I've been very lucky. Um, I've worked with a bunch of bands, like like dozens and dozens of bands, and very, very few that actually I'd say I'm just friends with because you know you have these short, intense little bursts of travel with them. Mm. But um, I've known those guys since I guess the mid nineties. I think maybe like nineteen ninety five was the first time I toured with them. Yeah. And I've been very, very lucky in, in, in like striking up like a genuine friendship with them, and and uh, I've like gone on tour in Europe with them, and, and stayed on the tour bus, and yeah, I've gone to a whole bunch of different countries with them, in Australia as well, and and uh, yeah, I've been very, very lucky in, in that fact. Like they're my favorite band in the world, just the raddest people, and very much uh, been very, very good to me, and yeah, just. So, yeah, I, I, I've, I've been very, and this, I'm not trying to sound cocky, I've been very fortunate in my life. I've had a lot of very surreal and, and good experiences and uh, I put part of that down to being in the right place at the right time, but also I, I very much, with that cup half full mentality, I have my eyes open for adventure. Like, I'm a big believer in what I call pirate life, but yeah. there's, um, there's people who... Uh, you know, have a plan of 18, this happens, then 25, then 40. I've, I've never been that kid. Like, I've, I've, I've never had a life goal. I've never had, like, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. I just literally fall into something and go, oh, okay, I'm going to run a bar now. Okay, I'm, I'm, I've got a record label. I'm going to play in a band. And um, you have to be open. Adventure doesn't necessarily just come and find you. That doesn't happen very frequently, i found. So you, mm. you really do have to sort of, so, and as much as like being a dude, it's so much easier as well. Like you know, like if it's this sucks. If I was a female and I jumped on a tour bus for a band for two weeks and nothing happened at all, yeah. there'd still be that assumption or insinuation for the most part that I must be sleeping with someone. Or mm. and, um, and uh, yeah, I've just been really lucky to to you know have a lot of crazy experiences at, with people. And and I, I think I, like for a long while I got. I got paid by promoters just to basically be a social tour guide for bands because I love talking to people. I love going, doing stuff. And so it made promoters jobs a lot easier or if they'd put me in a band with a band and I can know uh, that guy's a vegan, cool, I'll take him here. That guy wants to get a cuddle with a koala, take him here. That guy wants to get a tattoo, take him here. They need Wi-Fi, take him there. And, and uh, yeah, I had a lot of bad times doing that. How many times have you been to Australia Zoo? Uh, Australia's do not many Lone Pine. Oh, oh Lone Pine, hundreds. yeah, hundreds. <laughs> Lone Pine's just around, just around the corner from where, Lone Pine's just around the corner from where I live, and oh, nice. I've got my season. I, I got my season pass for that place. Um, <laughs> they were they were also very smart. They got on board. They were super smart. 
like almost prior social media. Like mm. you go, like, you know, there's just hundreds of photos in there in their uh, little canteen of, of, you know, the Pope with a koala and Marilyn Manson with a koala. And, and they were very early people on going, yep, yeah, bring bands here for free. It's no problems at all because they knew the exposure and publicity they'd get out of it. Absolutely. Um, and, and that's, I guess, well, yeah, the pirate life thing is just, you know, you sometimes have to sail uncharted seas to find better treasure, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it ties in with with your with the ADD. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I don't know if it was a conscious choice. It just sort of, I guess, is just the way things panned out. But I've always just been open to that idea of if someone says, hey, do you want to do this? I'm like, well, sure. Why not? Why wouldn't I want to do that? That sounds like an exciting time. And um, like I said, I think a lot of that ties back into my grandma dying and being yeah fearful of not, you know, eating that slice of pizza that I really wanted to eat, you know, of, of like, you know, there's, there's like, we live in a pretty crazy place, you know, we, the world's a pretty, pretty, pretty crazy place and a lot of bad ways sometimes, there's a lot of, so many fucking amazing people to meet and so many amazing things to do and I genuinely love talking to people, like, uh, I, when I started selling motorbikes, I said I'd only been riding motorbikes for a couple of years I'm the least technical dude in the world like I know nothing about engines I didn't grow up on dirt bikes and I'd smash the living shit out of my target all the time just because I like talking to people I, I find people very fascinating I find and so I love that pod, listening to podcasts you get these yeah. incredible stories from people I don't remember that I think it was an SBS show or ABC I can't remember called Up Front or Front Up or something like that was oh, dude would literally just walk it. around yeah, this guy would just walk around with a guy with a camera and just go and talk to people in the street, like very nondescript people, and get these incredible stories. And mm. I think part of what's wrong with the world at the moment is we dehumanize people. We forget, like, it's very easy to look at someone's skin tone or their weight or their sexuality or whatever and forget that they're a human who has hopes, who has dreams, who wants to be loved, who wants to you know, get to have sex, who wants to eat a nice meal and just has those things and those desires that we have. And I I find it really like I, I met uh, a flatmate of a friend of mine who, and I find people, people, uh, I know a lot of people who are like graphic designers and work in different industries and people meet people who have cool jobs on paper and they feel very embarrassed about saying what they do is work. You know, and I met this dude who was a flatmate of a friend of mine and I said, well, what are you for working? Like, I'm a public servant. I was like, no, 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 no. Okay, well, what do you actually do? And yeah. it turned out he'd, he's a young dude and he'd apply, he's an indigenous guy and he'd applied for a grant, got it, and implemented a sexual health program for remote indigenous teenagers. I'm like, dude, how fucking dare you say you're just a public servant? Like, you're actually out there changing and saving people's lives. And um, I think in Australia, we, we struggle so much with tall poppy syndrome. Oh. Big time. Like, Big time. you know, if you, if you say to an American person, you know, tall poppy syndrome, they're like, what? Mm. And it's like, you know, you know, when you knock someone for doing well, they're like, why, why would you do that? I think yeah. America probably goes too far the other way, but yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact what, with our, colonial, our colonialism. But uh, we are not a very forgiving country for people taking chances or you know, look at, What's that cricket player, dude? I'm not very good at sport ball. Um, Shane Warne, like the dude's Australia's greatest sporting hero, then sends a dirty text message, and all of a sudden he's the devil. It's like, well, no, no, he's a human. He's not, he's not like perfect. He's not gonna, you know, be without faults. And uh, I just find that that's, to me, if you sit down with someone and like I've got a, a weird thing that I do, you, you know, when you meet someone, someone says, "Hey, you on today?" And so yeah, yeah, I'm great. <laughs> well, their mother might have just died, but we're so conditioned into saying that we're okay, we say we're good. So I ask people to score their day out of 10. <laughs> and it's a really interesting thing to do because when you ask someone to score something like that, they actually pause for a second and they actually think about it for a second. And someone goes, oh, uh, three out of 10? And you're like, oh, fuck, okay, this person's really actually not having a good day. Maybe mm-hmm. I should talk to them about that. Or if someone says, man, nine and a half. And you're like, fuck, this person's having a great day. I want to find out why they're so stoked. And as I don't, know, I don't mean like lame as this sounds, please. And I like finding out that stuff. I, I like if I meet someone, I don't want to just go, "Oh, they've got a watch, they've got tattoos, they must be this sort of person." Like I was, like that that guy that's just on Joe Rogan podcast, the Jocko guy. 
I can, I'd read about him. I'd read some interviews, real brief interviews. I'd totally rip him off as this just fucking all American army jerk. Yeah. But then listen to that podcast, he fucking grew up listening, like going to see Cro-Mags and Bad yeah. Brains and Agnostic Front. And also I was like, what the fuck? And as the least judgmental as I should pride myself on being, I'm still, like everyone, I'll still look at someone and think I know who they are or what they are. I have no concept of the struggles they've been through or the things that they've achieved. And, and I think that's part of also why people get sad a little bit is because it's, it's a, a bad feeling to feel invisible. Like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if you speak to a lot of homeless people, they won't say that the cold sucks or maybe being in danger. They're like, it, it, it sucks being invisible. Like the people just don't, would anyone even know if I was dead? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, um, and I think if we just, if it's not hard just to take a little millisecond out of your day. Like I started doing this thing where, um, you know, I if someone annoyed me, I would make up a story about why they did what they did. Like, you know, if I get cut off in traffic, <laughs> I, instead of like honk, instead of honking the dude and flipping the bird at him, I'd be like, "Oh, that dude just got a phone call from his son's school, and his son's fallen over, broke his arm. He's got to get there and take care of him." Yeah. And all of a sudden, all my rage and anger and everything just go out the door because yeah, I, I, would, I would imagine if that was me going to my daughter's school, and it's just I don't know, just it. I just again the cup half full thing. I just like you know I don't I don't want to be angry at people that I don't know. <laughs> it's it's just breaking that pattern, isn't it? Like it's just it's this automated automated sort of thing that's ingrained in us. We're programmed to be reactive all the time to different things without even thinking, and it's it's sort of even. And, and again, I put I, yeah, go. I, I put a, I put a lot of that down to not like um, cortisol is a really interesting thing. The cortisol is a stress hormone that's a precursor to sort of fight or flight in your body. It's a very mm. important part of your body's function. But in excess amounts, it becomes poison in your body. And again, I'm looking down pat my belly at the moment. In men, <laughs> excess cortisol stores in body fat. It actually makes you store fat. Yeah. And um, again, same thing. After about you know the industrial revolution, give or take, we had fight or flight. You know, you were either chasing the the beast to catch it or running away from the beast so it didn't catch you. We had these big bursts of adrenaline and then rest and then big bursts of adrenaline. And we live in just constant low-level stress fuck especially women like I can't even fathom mm. the low-level stress that women live in all the time yeah. but generally as a society like you know we are stressed about fighting with our girlfriend or an assignment due at uni or not having enough money to pay bills so we, we live in this constant state of just slowly poisoning and stress is poison just pure and simple you know and so I guess I don't know how many years ago I just kind of and I still fuck it up. I still am, you know, far from on top of it completely. I just tried to concentrate as much as I could on being happy, not being right. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I don't, I don't have to win every argument anymore. I don't have to come out on top of a situation because that little dopamine hit was short lived. And so I just kind of like, you know, I just want to be happy. And it's a very, and as again, a little bit naff or lame sounding, I've just found that being happy, more better stuff happens. You know, it's just you know, whether whether that's complete coincidence, whether it's just that, you know, again, my eyes are open to someone saying, hey, come and have this meal with me or whatever. But for the most part, you know, when you're brewing a shit storm in your brain and in your gut, a, you feel sick, and B, it tends to attract more shitstorm to you. It does. I mean, you just you lose all focus and clarity when you're when you're riled up in a in a state of trying to win an argument or trying to trying to fight somebody to to to, to come out on top. And I, I mean, exactly the same. Where both of those things that you said, where you know, driving in the car and some assholes up your ass and and trying to, or driving like an idiot on the road and you want to just get your road rage on. And I do exactly the same thing where I'm thinking about what scenario they're in that's causing them to drive the way that they are. Maybe they're just a really unhappy person and you feel bad for them or there's an absolute emergency where they're, they're risking their life to drive like that because they're so desperate to get where to wherever they're going. They don't normally drive like that. And then exactly what you said about it's picking your battles and you sort of think, well, I can have this argument and I might know that they're wrong, but once I've proven my point and I've said my point and I've argued that point, 
what's the outcome going to be? Are they going to turn around and say, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, you're right. And I'll, you know, um, I'll rethink my ways and, and whatnot. And after that, even if that was the best case scenario, you still walk away with not, you know, not having any real benefit from the situation. You're just mentally exhausted and probably physically fatigued as well. And, 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 and more than likely the person drives off and didn't even aware, wasn't even aware of the fact they cut you off. And, and that's, that's it as well. That's it. Yeah. It's, um, it's amazing. I mean, everything's linked together as, as we were talking about earlier as well, where, you know, ment- uh, your mind's linked into your body and vice versa. And if you're, if you're stressed, then everything's stressed. And that comes into long-term health, longevity, you know, at lifespan and whatnot. And uh, if you're so focused on petty, trivial daily things and getting immersed in arguments and grudges and whatnot, then, you know, it could very well take a, take a toll on you lo- long-term if you're constantly stressed on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, absolutely. Do you, do you watch that um that show Justified? No. Uh, it's a great, it's like a modern Western sort of, and there's a, a the Raylan, the, the main character, his boss says something to him, and he continues using saying, "I love this is one of they're like you know memes are funny, but they're also like, oh shit, that's actually real. <laughs> it's that I think if if you run into an asshole in the morning, you ran into an asshole. If you run into assholes all day you're the asshole. That's it. I love it. <laughs> and man, it's just like, I remember when he said that in the show, I was like, oh, and all of a sudden you're like, yeah, those people were, oh, oh, wait, fuck, I'm the asshole. Yeah. You know, and there's very much a tendency, uh, sort of a psychological level, we, we think in global terms, everything's fucked. I don't have any friends. Everybody hates me. I'm never going to achieve anything. As a really, really good friend of mine, Tina, when I was struggling really hard to be like, eight years ago I was literally saying that everything's fucked and she's like really everything's fucked I was like yeah fucking everything's fucked and she's like what about Frankie and Frankie's my daughter I was like no Frankie's amazing and she's like okay so not everything's fucked and I was like no well fuck no, no fuck <laughs> fuck and you know it is that thing like we, yeah. we tend to catastrophize things Absolutely. and because for the most part the narratives we create are designed to fulfill something we need or a situation we need to happen. And so it is, you know, then when you're late to work, oh, I was, I was late because the traffic was shit and, you know, this guy cut me off and not, oh, I just didn't get up early and get ready on time. It doesn't suit, it doesn't necessarily suit our narrative to, to sort of actually take that on board. Mm. And I think we are conditioned to do that. I don't know yep. by what, by who, but just that it's, it's just easier to be angry sometimes, I think. And I think, and this sounds really, it's not meant to sound condescending or anything, but I think a lot of people live lives that do not have a lot of purpose in them. Mm. Um, and if you have somewhat of a vacuum inside your soul, if you, you know, you're searching for something, drama can feel better than nothing. Negative emotion will feel better than no emotion. Absolutely. So, so people's default is quite often to go to anger because it's the easiest one to sort of deal with and feel righteous about. Yeah. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And, uh, these, these days, and it's probably just more so because we're so connected instantaneously with, you know, instant messaging and social media and ordering online. And we expect so much, our, our expectations are through the roof, but it also, breeds this sense of entitlement and it's very it's very easy to react to things very quickly and overreact and there's this whole sort of you know white people problems (laughs) that's it you know we're we're victims and and that that example you said about being late for work it's easier to throw the blame at other other things around you than looking at yourself and going well actually you know I am the cause of the situation that I'm in, or maybe there's something that I can do to prevent this from happening in the first place. And, it, and, and, it's, yeah. and it's hard, it's hard to reflect upon. It's hard it to genuinely like, again, the same, same woman, Tina is amazing. Woman, uh, uh, Christina Childs, amazing photographer. Same thing. Like I, that same period of time, about eight years ago, I was fucking a bunch of stuff up and I was sure it was everyone else's fault. And, I was like, man, I'm so fucking sick of people picking on me for this. I don't remember what it was. And she's like, what, what do you mean? It? Like, like, different people are saying the same thing to you. I was like, what do you mean? She goes, like, you know, 
like, oh well, yeah, these people all said this thing to me. And she's like, do they know each other? I was like, <laughs> no. And she's like, dude, you know, I hate to burst your bubble. Which she's very tender about. It. She's like, a whole bunch of people who don't know each other are telling you the same thing. <laughs> There's a chance it's you. I was like, that's ridiculous. Like, don't doubt your shit. And I remember, like, I was living in a service apartment in the city by myself at the time. Uh, I just broke up with a really long term relationship. And um, I had a really hot shower, got out of the shower, and literally wiped the steam off the mirror and literally looked at myself in the mirror. And, like, it was probably 10 seconds, but this is a massive moment of, like, clarity. I went, oh, fuck, she's right. Like, she's absolutely right. It is me. And I remember it was always real first, like, adult things you're going. And it's really hard to admit you're wrong. It sucks. Mm. It's, it's, it's not, it's not, and also because, unfortunately, in society, we're not rewarded for admitting we're wrong. We're That's punished. It. So if you don't have something done on time at work, because you're stressed and you, you're worn out, your boss is very unlikely. You know what? Just take a half a day, go home, rest recoup your energy, come back tomorrow and work harder. You know, well, fuck you, you know, getting doctor hours paid, you know, whatever it is, you know, like we tend to not reward people for being honest. And so if you're honest about doing something wrong, it, you tend to get punished. So we, we train people to lie basically and not bad lies, but just omissions of truth. Like, you know, yeah. have you done your, have you, it's like if your mum rings you and says, do you do drugs? <laughs> you, know, like, <laughs> you know, is it, the good thing would be to honest, but you know that leads to a whole conversation. <laughs> that's it. That's it. We're, I mean, we're always searching for you know pleasure over pain, and we'll do whatever we can to avoid avoid pain. We're looking for that short term gratification straight away, and that's it too. we'll do whatever we can to get that. We won't think, well, it might be short term pleasure now, but it's going to lead to long term pain. Well, fuck, fuck the future. I'm I'm living in the now, <laughs> and I'll do whatever that, it takes. That, that, that's it. And, and, and unfortunately, again, because of those ways that things like jobs are set up and schools mm. set up, it's, you know, what happened? My dog ate my homework. <laughs> you know, it's just easier to say we're, we're sort of, again, conditioned to tell people what we think they want to hear mm. rather than the actual truth about stuff. And, yeah, we all tell lies. We all, like, you know, how, I caught a fish. How big was it? It was a foot. It wasn't. It was 20 centimeters. But 20 centimeters isn't a very good fish. So, does it really hurt anyone if I say it's 30 centimeters? No. <laughs> but it still does not tell the truth, is it? You know, so, it. you know, it, it's, and, and, you know, especially, you know, we build facades for ourselves. We build these outside versions which hide the fear and timidness we feel inside our bodies. Like, I'm pretty fucking heavily tattooed. Like, no one notices for the most part. They're all like peanuts and gay tacos and things like that. But, <laughs> like, I, not, and it's not like, Gay. That's, that's just to clarify for anyone who thinks it's an actual gay taco, not tacos are gay, like it's a, a gay taco. Um, <laughs> he's, fa he's fabulous. Um, <laughs> and so uh, we, we, we tend to, you know, a, again, you know, tattoos are a lie. They're not real. They're not your actual skin. They're pictures we put on ourselves to project a story. Um, you know, the, the band T-shirt we wear, the studded, belt we wear, the, you know, the, the $40,000 Breitling watch that someone buys, these are all lies. They're all, you know, not true. The truth is the human body doesn't have a watch. It has skin and that's it. Mm. But we put a watch on not just to tell time, but to present an image to someone. And that image may or may not actually be real. Absolutely. It's like, it's, well, it's the Instagram world, isn't it? We uh, we're, we're posting pictures of the of the best moments of our lives, and then we look at look at our friends and or strangers, and we go, oh, geez, my life sucks compared to this person who just seems to be on holiday twenty four seven um, all year. Absolutely, I I try my best to not do too much of that. Mm. I try a because I have ADD. Like I've posted, let me have a quick look, a fuck ton of photos. I started on Instagram in April 2011, I remember that, and I've posted 15,800 photos. Um, so I definitely have incurred the wrath of people. Like, I'll post a photo of giving myself an enema. Um, <laughs> I'll post, like, you know, like, I, and I do, I do, I'm a, I'm a really bad oversharer. I've censored myself because 
people don't need to see the actual pipe going up my bum when I'm doing it. So like, okay, <laughs> I'm, like, it's just a fun shot. But I, I kind of, I, I find it really strange. Like I'll meet people in real life that I've met on the internet before and they're like, dude, you're exactly like you are on the internet. And I'm like, what an odd thing to say. And at first it really confused me. Like what, who, who else would I be? And mm. then, you know, obviously like, you know, I've posted pretty openly about having depression. I've posted pretty openly about taking dexamphetamine for ADD, and I've posted pretty openly about successes I've had because I kind of like, I like sharing everything. You know, I, I like talking, yeah. and um, the internet's just another version of talking. But it, for sure, there is that 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 thing of you know, I've had a discussion with someone yesterday in regards to a business Instagram page. Like, oh, you know, how many people should I follow? I'm like. I don't know, you know, just so like I, I have roughly the same amount of followers on Instagram as people I'm following, and I'm because I'm not a business, I don't have to care about how that appears or whatever. But mm. it's not like you know, for, for a lot of people, is that oh, you know, like you look at some people's accounts and they go, you know, three thousand followers and they're following eight people, and it's like, are you really? That's that's it. You don't give a fuck about eight, you give a fuck about eight people, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's like is that real? That's strange to me. Like, sure, there's more than eight people. Like I love social media. I love you know it allows me to keep in contact and and, and share people's lives that I really genuinely care about. That's happening geographically a fucking long way away from me. Mm. So I really I really do like it. Like everything, it's good and bad. Um, and I think again that on that Joe Rogan podcast yesterday, they were talking about it a little as well. That you know as as people's perceptions become more and more, this perfect life someone's leading. Does it lead people to then go? Okay, no, no, I'm searching for something a little bit more real than that now. You know, yeah. what, I want some more. I, I just um, probably also I was having this discussion with my friend Caroline last night because I fucked up so much stuff in my life. I've made a real effort to try and be more transparent in what I do now. Mm. So it, it it stops situations of me fucking stuff up. If you know what I mean, does that make sense? Like you know, it's 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 harder to if everyone knows what's going on, it makes life a lot easier. Just rip, yeah. rip, rip, rip the band-aids off. Also, part of it's a self-defense mechanism where it's hard for people to hang shit on me if I've literally just posted a photo of myself with a tube up my ass. Like, it's pretty, <laughs> you know, like, it's, 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 you got it's nothing pretty on hard. Me. Well, that's it, dude. It's like, it's like you know, uh, I've, I've had scenarios where I've read terrible things about myself on the internet. Some of them factual, some of them very unfactual. It's not a pleasant feeling mm. reading bad stuff about yourself. Um, especially when it's not deserved, when it is deserved, it feels terrible. But when it's not deserved, it feels even worse. Mm. Um, and so, I, I think I've definitely this is a discussion I was having with my friend last night about trans. Like, I, I'm definitely more transparent than most people. I think online, probably yeah, with the enema photos, more transparent than people would really want. But um, it's it's also probably part of what makes me happier. I think is that I don't have you know that. Like, you know, there's people who leave picture-perfect Instagram lives. You mm. know that that's not the reality, and that's got to weigh on them. Like, that, doesn't well, that got, have to... They, they're going to maintain They're going to get... That's it, and that's fucking... And I've done that. I've, I've tried to maintain those facades of everything's okay when I'm not okay, and it's fucking exhausting, dude. Mm. Like, it's so tiring. It's so much easier. And once... What, pe- people are very scared to ask for help. People are very scared to let people know they're not okay. Mm. And I've always been pretty lucky in that I've felt comfortable asking for help. I've felt comfortable for the most part letting people know I'm not okay in a situation. And it's so good, that feeling of when you tell someone something's wrong and they're just okay with it. It's the best feeling in the world. It's like, oh, thank fuck. You know, like, shit, I can, I can, get, I can get this sorted now, you know. I think a lot of people don't even know what that feeling is. Like to be honest, especially especially now, like you know, oh, I've got I've got mates online that you know will post something on Facebook and it's like this cry out, you know, of of help or whatnot. Not directly at anybody, but it's just it's you know this. Yeah, they're this in pain. Out. Yeah, and and so everyone will comment and say, oh, you know, hey man, hope you're okay and take care and everything like that, and and then that's it. Or you might get a couple of love hearts on the Facebook status or something along those lines. And and people think that's enough. And, yeah, you might get a little instant uh, good feeling where you go, oh, well, yeah, people are reacting to me online. I'm getting some notifications and, and that little dopamine hit and, and I feel okay for 10 seconds. But then you go back to reality of feeling like shit. 
And a lot of people yeah. just don't have somebody where you, you look over and your phone's ringing and, and it's a friend saying, hey, I'm going to come over in a sec. Do you want to just hang out for a bit or come over and, and let's, let's, let's just chill out and talk? And I don't think a lot of people have that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and it's, I think, part of what leads us to have such a horrific suicide rate in this country. Yeah. Like, I've, I've had a couple really close friends, um, you know, take their own lives in the last few years. And I think for the most part, it's they just want the noise to stop at that time. There's mm -hmm. so much stress and pressure on them. But there is definitely that that thing of like it's it's not a country, it's not a society. You know, sadly, especially for men, where it's, it's being being weak is perceived perceived as being very negative. You know, it's so um, crazy that it's, it's still like that even now. You'd think that you'd think that wouldn't be as common, but it's, it's so it's just it's 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 the rule rather than the exception it's just so prevalent oh dude it's like like chris cornell's committing suicide yeah did it make me sad fuck yeah it made me really sad that some dude took his own life did it surprise me no not really like i you know sure oh, well that was weird i didn't know he was sad because i don't mm. know the fucking dude but also at the same time it's not surprising to hear someone killing themselves because a lot of people are really really unhappy because and I mean, Chris Cornell had to live his Instagram life, if you know what I mean, but because we, we live these facades and it, that it is exhausting to maintain that all the time. And at some point, you're going to run out of energy for it. That's it. That's it. You know, a, a, a lie is always going to catch up with you. And if your, your lie is your entire life, man, it's gonna, that's going to swing a big hammer at you at some point, isn't it? Well, definitely. And I think what you're doing as far as just it, this unfiltered documentation of your life, it, I think it just probably, I mean, I'm, putting words in your mouth but i'm assuming that by doing that you're appreciating even something that maybe you know a few years ago might have been a boring photo to you or you think that everybody else thinks it's a boring photo but now everything that you put up there is it's just another part of your day and and there's a bit of appreciation for everything that you do absolutely i mean a big part of it is i'm a super needy dude with add so literally it's like <laughs> look a, a shiny thing tell me i'm good tell me i'm good a shiny thing like, um, there, there is definitely that thing. Like, I, I do, I can't create art. I don't have an artistic bone in my body. I can mm. hardly fucking write a song. I can't hold a tune. I can't draw. I can't sculpt. I can't paint. I can't do anything. But, and this sounds really fucking wanky, that's my art form is just documenting. Like, I'm, I, I'm documenting me. And I, part of it is that I have very bad memory. I don't, like I said, I, I don't have a lot of memories being a kid. Um, and also in my brain, I can't see pictures. Like if I, I, I close my eyes, I can't see pictures mm. and I very, very rarely dream. And when I do, they're black and white. I dream like that I can remember a handful of times a year and they're very boring, like I'm going shopping. And so I have this fear of losing very fond memories. Mm. So I, I think that's part of why I take so many photos and like I said, I'm, I'm a needy fucking kid. I'm the black sheep of my family. My mum, my dad, both in the army. My granddad on one side was in the Navy. My granddad on the other side was in the Air Force. My sister's an award-winning federal police officer who, on the same day I was getting arrested in Brisbane, she was getting awarded officer of the month <laughs> in Ocean, an Oceanside PD in San Diego. And, like, you know, I'm, I'm the absolute black sheep of the family. So... I definitely have that little, like, that little, you know, oh, somebody loved me. Um, and uh, the, the, I definitely have filtered a little bit of somewhat, like, like I said, like, you know, for instance, when I was working, selling the Harley Davidson's, I was on tour with Malfix in Europe during a period of time. And as you may imagine, doing drugs from time to time, and I would never post a photo of doing drugs while on someone else's dime as a pay packet because that's kind of like disrespectful to my bo to my mm -hmm. bosses, you know, because like a customer could see that go, well, I, my dad was a cocaine addict and I'm not going to buy a bike now. So th there's definitely, there is some filters in there because, you know, oh man, this is a really funny, really funny story. So when I was in Japan just a couple months ago, my friend Alex and I went to the suicide forest and oh, yeah. fuck, dude, it was intense. Near, near we didn't, Fuji? Did, Yes, yes, yeah. sir. It was very, very intense. Uh, didn't find a body, thankfully. At first, I was really excited about finding a dead body. I was like, well, oh my God, I'm in stand by me. It's going to be amazing. And then we, we, we hiked for about three hours and followed the strings. We found everything. And I was like, oh, I don't want this to happen. Mm. And um, so 
I posted a photo on Instagram. But it's this really beautiful photo of because it snowed when we were there, which is really weird the timing of it. And it's this beautiful photo I took of a wooden seat for two people with forest pine. I went suicide forest, Mount Fuji, Japan. So we're hiking for about three hours, three hours round trip. We get back. I get back in the mobile phone reception and a voicemail pops up from my parents' phone number. I'm like, oh, no. my parents? Well, what the fuck are my parents ringing me for? Oh. And so I, I listen to it as a voicemail from my dad going, yo, yeah, hello, just, you know, just check it in to see what's going on and how you're doing. And so I'm like, oh my God, they've thought I'm going to kill myself. And oh, so no. I've, rung, I've, rung, I've rung my dad. He's like, g'day, how you doing? I'm like, yeah, good, good, yeah. Alex and I were just in the suicide forest and having a walk around something really pretty and Dad's like, oh, yeah, that sounds interesting. Oh, yeah. Blah, blah. Like, anyone else would go, what? Suicide forest? What the <laughs> fuck's that? Because, like, oh, my God, my poor parents have thought I've gone with my gay lover to commit suicide in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, so there, there, are, there, are some, there are some filters in there. Yeah, but yeah. I think definitely, like I said, I've had, like, long, I, I, as you can tell, like, talking, I have these really intense conversations, but with, like I said, very small group of friends that I have, but, that there's definitely a self-defense mechanism on it. If I post my weakest moments, it's very difficult to feel as though someone has any leverage over me or anything to hold over me. So there's definitely that element to it. Mm. Um, part of it, like you said, is just having ADD and being needy. But part of it's just, it's, and this is, again, I'm trying not to sound like a fucking wanky here. <laughs> I'm, a really, I'm a really average person. I'm not tall. I'm not short, I'm not fat, I'm not skinny, I'm not rich, I'm not poor, I'm not smart, I'm not dumb, I don't have a big cock, don't have a small cock. Uh, it's just, there's, there's, there's nothing remarkable about me at all, but I have a fuck ton of fun and a fuck ton of adventures. And again, hopefully this doesn't make me sound like a fucking prat. I like to think that by me showing adventures that I have, in sometimes very simple things, just like, you know, just admiring a simple beauty of something somewhere that might make someone just stop for a second and go, oh, hey, I've never noticed that abandoned building before. Like, you should go and look at that abandoned building. Like, I, I like, I like, you know, I get down stormwater drains with people and go exploring. I like exploring abandoned buildings. So much stuff in your own city that we forget. Like, we walk over footpaths and roads every day and we forget that there's these, tunnels under us and that there's buildings you can explore and forests you can explore and and so I, I kind of in a very naive way hope that someone might go oh I don't have to take a selfie 50 times to try and get the perfect smile <laughs> I can do that as well but I can also post a photo of you know of the student dog shit <laughs> you know and it's, it, it's funny to you know like I said, at the end of the day, we're all going to fucking die. Whether you think we're going to get reincarnated, whether you go to heaven, hell, whatever, we're all on a one-way ticket somewhere. Mm. And, and again, going back to those funny old cliches, it is good to stop and smell the roses a little bit, to, to, to take a pause from the stress. And going back to, to what we're talking about, about mindfulness and stuff like that, yeah. just of being in that moment, uh, just, you know, you can, there is a lot of stuff, like, there's a lot of really evil, bad shit around us as well. If you focus on all that, you're going to have a bad time. And I, I guess, have definitely chosen not to ignore bad stuff far fucking from it, but to also go, hey, there's there's good stuff here as well, you know, that there is, there is very simple enjoyments that we can have that don't cost money, that don't, you know, this is, you know, just adventures everywhere. There's, there's adventures to be had. There's treasure to be found. There's not treasure's not necessarily a uh, a gold coin. Treasure can be, you know, rummaging through a thrift store or finding uh, an abandoned house or finding an old car in someone's shed and doing it up. Like there's 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 a sense of purpose to be found for people. It's perspective, really, isn't it? I mean, you you create your own realities, and you know you could be driving along on the highway, and you see everybody in their cars, and everyone's in their little bubble, and that's their that's their own little world, and and it's it's based off what you focus on, and you could almost you know with that analogy of being in the car, it's whatever whatever radio station they're tuned into, or whether they're listening to something off their phone, or they're listening to a podcast, or whatever it is. It, it's all creating a different world inside each of those cars. It's zooming along the highway, and um, 
it's 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 your view it's 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 what you make of it and what you what sort of input you're giving yourself as well and um i think i think the way that the way that or at least your approach and and not doing it consciously so to speak but i think you probably would be giving people a lot of reassurance that they don't have to put up this picture perfect you know page or posts on social media in general to try and make sure that people think that they uh you know an exciting and interesting person constantly doing something amazing where you know you 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 can just go to the shops and go and buy something from the from the supermarket Dude, and just, just take, come home. Uh, and just Take, take a funny photo of something. Yeah, you know, a funny like, sign like or something like that, like your badge accountants. That <laughs> like taxation. That. Yeah. So good. <laughs> who, was, who was thinking that was a good idea? Um, <laughs> you know, and, and even as simple as like my daughter Frankie's love, she loves doing the spotto thing. Like we drive driving somewhere, she goes, spotto, and it's old hold or something. And, you know, like there's just that you use those really simple pleasantries in life. And again, you know, with modern society and, and, the interwebs, you can get very caught up in something fucking terrible happening in Manchester or something fucking shit house in Syria. And at the same time that you're stressing and worrying about those things, you've walked past or driven past something really beautiful. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'm keeping you on the time. I've got one last thing to, to ask you before we wrap it up. The, the beer can. inches. <laughs> uh, the beer can the beer, the beer cannon is okay so I've ever since I was a little kid I've been obsessed with sending a Guinness World Record and because I don't actually have any talents it's really hard to do mm. so uh, I was I started thinking about how do I set a Guinness World Record okay the easiest way is to do something no one else has done so the beer cannon's idea I came up with uh, with the company Taps of doing some social media stuff for and started doing the Bounty Hunter Brewing guys mm. and um uh, they're metal dudes. Do you know? Do you know the Bounty Hunter people? No, I don't. Oh, you should, you should introduce yourself to them. I think you're in Sydney, aren't you? Yeah, I think they're in Sydney. I'll take you guys in some photos. Oh. Um, and so basically, uh, the idea was to see how far we can fire a full can of beer out of a beer can and air tower beer cannon. Um, it's kind of in the holding pattern at the moment for a few reasons. One, Guinness haven't approved it yet. They've approved another one of my record attempts, which I don't want, I don't know, it sounds really shitty, I'll say it because I don't want someone to steal it yet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you off here. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but and also, very, very sadly, up here uh, a few months ago, a dude died on the set of a, I think it was Bliss and Esso film clip shoot. Yeah, yep. um, Because of uh, some uh, just very bad set of circumstances where uh, he was shot with a shotgun with blanks and it still killed him. It was very, very sad. And so anything I've been in contact with, obviously the weapons and licensing, it was, it was, the thing we're going to build is with Dr. Danger, my friend who, who's a, uh, you know, he's a crazy builder and, and Adam I do the, the prop stuff with um, and I've got a ballistics engineer on board the, the theory is we could come close to cracking a kilometre with it um, yeah like it's, 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 it's and like when I was talking to, I was talking to weapons licensing people and the dude's like he's like yeah this is this is an actual weapon it's not it's not kind of like you know, it's a beer counter it's funny that this is because my original idea was to, to shoot it inside Suncorp Stadium the old, old um, oh yeah yeah like, like, but then I was suddenly like Oh fuck! Like, I don't want to. I know it sounds really ridiculous, but in in, in light of what happened with the film clip shoot, with the, the with the, so like I don't want to fucking kill someone, and so we kind of went, okay, we need to take this further afield. So we've got a couple of properties that have been offered to us, like you know, hundred acre properties. We, but I, I thought it was best to get in contact with the weapons license people, and they're like, yeah, 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 this is this you you, you can go to jail for doing this. If you, know, if you killed someone, it would be bad. So um, the actual. Beer can itself, there's a functioning version of, of it already. So now it's just a case of waiting for Guinness to approve it and um, then to, just to make, to make it happen, basically. But this is also uh, kind of part of the idea of doing the stuff like Frankie's Arcade, is it? Mm. So I can be a douchebag and go, oh, I want to build a beer can. And then, you know, you can actually go and do it. Like, you've got this, this small income 
that keeps you alive so you can go and build a beer cannon somewhere and fire it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I Guinness, Book, Guinness Book of Records is always one of those things where every year I get it for my birthday or for Christmas. I, I was really obsessed with I, I, I don't read a lot of books because of the ADD thing. And I'm so, well, I love podcasts. And um, so, but Guinness World Records gives us little tiny bits of information which are really easy for me to digest. Yeah. And I, uh, you know, like, you know, reading about Robert Wadlow, the world's tallest man, or you know, who the person yeah. had the longest fingernails. And <laughs> it's a bit weird now. It's, and now it's like the Guinness Book of Odd Fact. Like, I remember reading a few years ago and it was like, the world's most famous co-joined twin is Andy Garcia, the actor. I'm like, well, that's weird because I didn't know he was a co-joined twin. <laughs> and also, how, how do you how do you ratify that? How do you say he's the most famous? Not, that's not a fact. It's not a record, you know? So I was a bit weird out by that. But um, yeah, so, so basically, it's also the idea of these things that I'm trying to do on the no-stress factor is it happens when it happens. Yeah. If it doesn't ever happen, fuck it. I tried. didn't happen. If it does happen... It's not a big burden. It's not a stress. It's not like a, this punishing deadline to meet. It's just, you know, these things aren't, these stupid ideas I have for things like this aren't designed to make money or, or be a living or, or anything. It's meant to be like, oh, I've just wanted to fucking get a sword record since I was a kid. You know, like it's just one of those, like uh, at Netherworld last week, I sat there and watched all the staff members, Tyson set a world record for point blank, that shooting game. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and as, as whatever you love or hate computers, whatever. But at that very moment, he's number one out of seven point something billion people or something. Like that's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty fucking cool, you know? Like cool. you are <laughs> the best in the entire world. Like you are the, like there's not many times you get to be the, the, the number one, the pinnacle or something, you know? And it was really wild watching you do it. Like it probably took him, I guess an hour, like, you know, a few flustered attempts, not quite there. And, and it was, and again, this is the simple beauty thing of something. Like, you know, at that, like someone could beat the record the next day. Who fucking knows? But for that moment, right then, he was the very best at something in the entire world. And that's a port, that's a porch story, you know. Like Absolutely. That, you know, when, when you're sitting with your grandkids on your knee and they're playing some crazy holographic virtual reality game that doesn't exist yet and you're like yeah dude that would tell you the time that granddad was the best in the world at point blank you're like <laughs> don't be stupid granddad you're never the best at anything because old people because old people are dumb you know and then he'll be able to pull out the video and show them and they're like for a minute grandpa will be cool again you know and that's why, like that. that's a really good example of the real simple beauty in some things you know like you know that yeah like that's you know, that dude probably slept really well that night you know, he probably went to bed with a very, very well earned smug grin on his face, blanket <laughs> tucked up under his chin, like I'm the best. You know, like the, you know, like Top Gun theme song in his back, you know, <laughs> Danger Zone or something playing on the stereo, and you know, I think, I think that's kind of cool. I think that that's you know, and that's not something he had to spend millions of dollars to do. He didn't have to have a Formula One racing team, or he didn't have to have the backing of massive commercial sponsors, and. Is he going to be famous for it? No, but for that moment, he, like I said, I think that's that's a pretty fucking cool thing to be out of seven billion and some change people to be the number one or something. That's pretty cool. That's really cool. Yeah. And I and I hope that um, you'll eventually get onto a page in the Guinness Guinness Book of Records. I hope so, sir. I really <laughs> do. Like it's, it's it's that same thing. It's that 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 sense of I definitely have a sense of entitlement in that stuff. Like. Why shouldn't I have a world record? Well, <laughs> you're not you're not good at anything. There's the first reason, you know. But you know, well, that shouldn't stop me having. A, why do I have to be good at something to be the best? And that's why I kind of like the Guinness World Records because you didn't actually have to be good at something per se. You just had to actually do it. You know, that's Robert it. Wadlow didn't have any skill at growing tall. Like he didn't train for it. The fucking poor dude just had to be seven foot tall or something. You know, but he's still the tallest man in the world, you know? <laughs> so I'm kind of like, okay, like, uh, right, uh, no other record I could get would be the most average dude ever. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I kind of like the idea of, it's not, it's not like fake it till you make it kind of thing, but you know, like, okay, well, I, I kind of have a, a good dose of oppositional defiance disorder. So it's kind of like, if I can't, if I'm told, like, if you want me to do something, just tell me I can't. And I, I literally <laughs> will have it done by that afternoon. And really? I, you don't think I can do this? Well, now I have to do it. Um, and so it's that, that, there's that sort of like, that, yeah, bit of a jerk attitude, I guess, about entitlement of like, well, 
I'm surely I'm special. <laughs> I must be special at something. Beer cannon. And again, I'm just lucky that I can't actually build a beer cannon, but I've got friends that can, but I can come up with the idea of it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And you, you help execute it. And I think that's part of, that's probably part let's of. Not use the word ex- let's not use the word execute in relation to the beer cannon. <laughs> <laughs> Poor choice of words. <laughs> I, I, can, I, can make it a, I can make it a reality. That's it. That's it. And I think the big thing, you know, you said it a few times about being just like this average guy and just sort of mediocre, sort of f- hovering sort of in the middle, off the radar, so to speak. But I think the secret that you probably got with a lot of these things that you've done and you've you've had all these great experiences is that you just, you've just shown up. And most people, don't, most people do not show up. But see, that's also because that's the lens that I know we're probably running out of time, that lens is like, you know, I get bummed out and you do, oh, fuck, participation award. You shouldn't get an award for participating. Well, fuck yeah, you should. Yeah. But your reward doesn't have to be a pennant or a medal or something. Like, the reward is, is the the actual activity you're doing, you know? Like, mm. it, that, that's exactly it. Like, I can't play guitar, but I've, I've played guitar twice for NoFX Live on stage. I'm <laughs> like, almost almost incapable of, of playing more than four chords. That's why I love punk rock. But I still got to play with my all-time favorite band, in front of thousands of people a couple of times, you know, that's ridiculous. But just because I said yes to opportunities. That's it. Absolutely. Well, I think that's a good way to end off this chat. That's um, far out, man. You've exceeded any expectations I had. I was expecting uh, just a couple of quick things, but um, oh, I think, um, I think we've been... I can talk, I can talk like a motherfucker. No, One that's... Hour and... One hour and fifty minutes. <laughs> no, that's that's good. Someone someone that's matching me. Usually, I'm the one that's just rattling off and just and someone needs to tell me to shut up or someone's casually looking at the time, going, "Oh, anyway." I'm like, "Oh shit, talking, yeah, lovely, talking lovely, too, lovely, lovely, talking lovely, too lovely. much again." Yeah, <laughs> but I tell you what, um, yeah, very uh, a lot of things that you said are very reassuring, and I think uh, in some ways we probably separated at birth. There's a lot of there's a lot of a lot of uh, things that you've experienced and and perspectives that you have now and uh yeah i'm, I'm very very similar spot or um very very similar sort of uh outlook so that needs to be really good for both of us or really terrible for both of us well that, that's it that's it sometimes sometimes i'm uh, going on the good side <laughs> yeah yeah let's let's focus on that yeah well Excellent. thank you thank you so much for letting me talk yeah no worries we'll, we'll have to do another one sometime down the track um actually before we wrap it up is there anything that um, that you want to plug at all? Like for, I mean, the website's we make trouble dot com. Yeah, but got- see, this thing, it's not. It's, I don't do anything there. Oh, I have like yeah, people go there, and uh, I'll have a bunch of stuff up for sale of weird collectible crap. Yeah, but really, no, no I but I don't have any. I'm trying as hard as I can. God, this is a whole other fucking podcast. <laughs> um, I'm trying to remove agendas from my life. All right, gotcha. I'm, tr- I'm, I'm trying to remove having a purpose for doing something. My purpose in talking to you tonight was you seem like a super interesting dude. You asked me to do it, which is very flattering. So I just want to have a really fucking good conversation with someone. And I'm finding more and more and more, the less agenda I have, the more I'm enjoying things. Awesome. Well, maybe maybe what we can say is I'll, I'll, put, a, I'll put a link to your Instagram page and people can check out some of your pictures. I'll do another coffee animal. I'll talk soon yeah thanks man take care cheers sir bye 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 cheers fellas and sheilas hope you enjoyed that uh, chat with James really really cool conversation and uh, as I said at the start of the episode I feel like we've been separated at birth really really awesome to talk to somebody that's uh, on a very similar wavelength to to me personally so really really enjoyed that if you want to reach out to james and say hello which i really encourage you to do as with all of my previous guests go over to andysocial.net and you can go to the show notes for this episode i'll have all the links and details for james on there um really really encourage you to check out what uh, some of the things that he gets up to and as he said at the end of the episode he's doing his best to not have any agendas anymore and try not to plug things and whatnot but at the same time i think it'd be really cool um for people to just reach out and connect and say hello and i think he'd probably dig that as well so uh another amazing and cool guest that's uh, been a part of the antisocial podcast so thanks james very cool 
All right, I'm going to wrap this up. A uh, little bit of the boring old housekeeping stuff. Rating and reviewing on iTunes is amazing. And uh, if you can do it, I will love you a long time. Um, you can also subscribe on there. That th Those little things do wonders for this podcast showing up in more search results uh, when people are searching for random podcasts. So hopefully some of you have found me by accident and uh, via some of those means. So hopefully it's working. But uh, if you can do those things, that's amazing. Um, sharing, all these episodes are on YouTube as well, or just find me and the podcast on all the different social media platforms and do all those little social media interaction things, likes, loves, retweets, comments, tags, whatever you want to do. It all helps. But if you can't do any of that, the fact that you're listening and you're still listen listening right now as I stumble through the outro of this episode, thank you. And it means a lot. This is really cool. It's a lot of fun. 